Good morning, everyone. Call this hearing to order. It's good to see some familiar faces from yesterday's tour. I'm Council Member Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and I want to welcome everyone to this joint hearing with the Committee on Criminal Justice, chaired by Council Member Keith Powers, on the implementation and expansion of the state's Raise the Age legislation, particularly as it relates to the detention of juveniles. We're joined by Council Member Farrah Lewis from Brooklyn, and um, I know that other council members will be joining us throughout the rest of the hearing. October 1st marked the second and final phase of implementation of Raise the Age, which includes a sweeping set of changes to how the courts, detention, and probation deal with youth in the criminal justice system. Generally speaking, the new laws bring New York State in line with the rest of the country in recognizing that children must be treated differently from adults. All 16 and 17 year olds whose cases would have gone through the adult criminal justice system will now either be sent directly to family court or to the youth part of Supreme Court. As we will hear, the implementation of Raise the Age has coincided with a meaningful decline in arrests and criminal court cases citywide, including among youth. Additionally, a variety of plans exist to keep youth out of detention while their cases are pending. Nonetheless, youth-oriented facilities exist to provide appropriate forms of detention when it is deemed necessary. When it comes to detention, the Raise the Age transition has been challenging. We saw the Department of Corrections placement of correctional officers from adult facilities in a juvenile facility at Horizon even though DOC's methods of dealing with adult populations was one of the main reasons that Raise the Age required the removal of youth from adult facilities in the first place. And as a consequence, we have the report of the Federal Monitor appointed under the Nunes Settlement in 2015, which found that staff use of force increased even though youth-on-youth -youth violence remained about the same. Specifically, the Monitor's October 28, 2019 report found 440 uses of force between October 2018, when the changeover at Horizon began, and June of 2019, including 228 injuries to youth or staff at Horizon. ACS's own data is very troubling. At Horizon, use of force dipped slightly in the first quarter after the changeover, but has risen both quarters since. Fights have, been remain, have remained flat, meaning there has not been progress in reducing the number of fights that occur at Horizon. At Crossroads, use of physical restraints has increased each quarter, and fights spiked dramatically in the last quarter. We know that ACS has yet to hire the hundreds of youth development specialists whose services and expertise are necessary to fully replace DOC personnel at Horizon. <laughs> Council Member Powers, uh, Lewis, and I were given the opportunity to visit the Horizon facility yesterday to see firsthand the improvements that have been made or attempted to be made in the areas of programming, infrastructure, and health services. We were also aware that ACS is seeking permission to bring some of the adolescent offenders currently detained at Crossroads in Brooklyn to Horizon in the Bronx, and it would be helpful to hear more about that plan. I'll just say a word about the Close to Home program. For those youth who have been adjudicated to require some form of placement, ACS administers a program called Close to Home. It is designed as an alternative to the statewide system that used to send children to geographically isolated institutions far from the city. It includes non-secure and limited secure placements and an aftercare program, and it represents an innovative approach to juvenile justice. We look, hearing, we look forward to hearing more about the Close to Home program today. Finally, we will consider legislation council, sponsored by Council Members Rafael Salamanca of the Bronx and Alika Ampri Samuel of Brooklyn, intro 1628. This is a data collecting and reporting bill 
that will allow the public and the council to easily find and understand demographic information about the population of all juvenile justice facilities and the conditions inside them. We look forward to hearing from ACS, the Department of Corrections, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, public defender organization, service providers, and other stakeholders on how we can continue to improve outcomes for the children whom Raise the Age was attended, intended to help. Um, with that, I would invite uh, the co-chair of this hearing, Council Member Keith Powers, to make a statement. Thank you to Chair Lansman and good morning. Thank you everybody for being here today. My name is Keith Powers. I'm the chair of the Committee on Criminal Justice. I want to thank Chair Lansman for holding this joint hearing today on implementation of Raise the Age. And I want to thank all the folks who were able to give us uh, a tour yesterday and were able to join us and answer questions. As chair of the committee overseeing the Department of Correction, I'm particularly interested today in exploring the conditions at Horizon Juvenile Center, which is where we were yesterday and is jointly operated by ACS and DOC. I'm interested to hear from the department about how the facility is running with one year into imp implementation of Raise the Age, what's working and what needs improvement. Uh, as we know and has been mentioned, uh, there have been several notable trends in the use of force of Horizon that we will be asking about today, as well as many recommendations in terms of staffing, policies around room confinement and classification. Uh, I hope to hear today from the department uh, that the department is carrying out those recommendations. Well, I'm happy to hear that there have been some improvements on stabilization and violence. Uh, I'm interested to learn what steps the DOC and ACS plan to take to continue to reduce violence moving forward. We also know that several variances to the Board of Correction minimum standards have been granted to Horizon over the years, including a variance on minimum standards pertaining to correspondence, dry cells, nurseries, and law libraries. Uh, I'd be interested today in hearing more about the criteria guiding some of those variances and about ACS's long-term plans to ensure that all children in custody get appropriate services. Uh, so thank you to all today. I want to particularly thank my staff for uh, helping to put the gate together today's hearing and looking forward to hearing testimony from the administration. With that, I'll turn it now back to Chair Lansman. All right, let's uh, swear everybody in and we can get started. You raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Terrific. Have you decided amongst yourselves on an order to uh, present? Go, proceed. Good morning, Chair Lansman, Chair Powers, Councilmember Lewis. My name is Jordan Stockdale, and I am Deputy Director for Close Rikers in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Shatad Floyd, Mock J's Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, is here with me as well to answer questions. New York City has long been a supporter of treating 16 and 17 year olds more appropriately within the juvenile justice system and applauded the state for its passage of Raise the Age in April of 2017. This important reform came amid a rapidly shrinking juvenile justice system and success builds on ongoing efforts to treat young people fairly and appropriately in New York City. Following broader trends in the criminal justice system, from 2014 to 2018, the number of 16 and 17 year olds in custody dropped 55% and the number of children in juvenile detention dropped 65%, even as our overall crime rate continued its downward trend. Since the state passed Raise the Age legislation in April 2017, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice began leading a planning process with the participation of relevant city agencies, the courts, district attorneys, public defenders, and nonprofit providers. As part of this effort, our office formed working groups focused on court processing, programming and diversion, data analytics, and facilities. Central to this work was a recognition of key values that anchored our implementation of Raise the Age. One, fairness. Justice outcomes for 16 and 17 year olds should improve following the implementation of Raise the Age, not worsen. Two, safety. That we should detain and, or incarcerate children no more than absolutely necessary. Incarceration is not an appropriate response for children with challenging needs who have no place to go. Continuity. Whenever possible, ensure continuity of defense counsel, court of record, and prosecutorial agency. Lastly, speed. Remove appropriate cases from the superior, youth, superior court youth part to family court system in a swift and timely manner. Fewer kids arrested, fewer kids in detention, and safer streets. 
This is the story of Ray ZH. While arrests of young people have declined precipitously throughout this administration, since Ray ZH was passed, we've seen even greater declines. As detailed in our recent report, in the first nine months of Ray ZH, misdemeanor arrests of 16-year-olds declined by 61%, and 17-year-olds 32%. Felony arrests declined by 21% during the same time period for 16-year-olds. Moreover, the average daily population of youth ages 17 and under in adolescent or juvenile detention facilities declined by 30%, again, in the same time period. Over the past two years, we have worked to prepare for the implementation phases and to make system improvements to our facilities necessary for effective implementation of the law. As you know, prior to October of 2018, the city moved all 16 and 17-year-olds out of jails on Rikers Island and into Horizon, a facility specialized for juveniles and adolescents. From that point onward, all 16 and 17-year-olds detained in New York City have been housed in Horizon or Crossroads, the city's two age-appropriate facilities dedicated to this purpose, or in non-secure detention. The Raise the Age legislation also created new court processes. As of October 1st, 2019, 16 and 17 year olds arrested on misdemeanor charges for offenses occurring on or after that date automatically go to family court. Those who are charged with felonies, as well as individuals under 16 years of age charged with specific serious felonies, are arraigned in the new youth part in superior court of each borough. Youth part judges receive specialized training in adolescent development from the Office of Court Administration. In order for a case to remain in the youth part, a district attorney must demonstrate the extraordinary circumstances exist that should prevent the removal of the case to family court. While a case is pending in the youth part, a judge will decide whether to release the youth with no conditions, set bail, place that person under community supervision, or remand. If, after a finding of guilt, the judge imposes a sentence of incarceration, the young person will serve the sentence locally or in an OCFS facility. The development of this entire new court system with accompanying court processes required significant coordination among the courts and numerous city agencies. It is notable that during the first year of Raise the Age, approximately 80% of children deemed adolescent offenders uh, arra were arraigned in, the youth sorry, arraigned in the youth part were removed to family court. Young people designated as juvenile delinquents, JDs, those with cases in family court, now must include 16 and 17 year olds who pre previously moved through the adult court system. Department of Probation staff interview youth charged in family court to determine if the case may be resolved early through a process known as adjustment. When a case is adjusted, it can be permanently sealed if the young person abides by certain conditions set up by the Department of Probation. If it is not adjusted, the case is referred to law department, which acts as the prosecutor in the case investigates the allegations against the young person, and then decides whether to proceed with juvenile delinquency charges in family court. Since the passage and implementation of Raise the Age, these judicial decisions can be made outside of the confines of the court's daytime hours, with courts available on nights, weekends, and holidays. If after a plea or finding, a family court judge enters a formal finding that a youth is a JD, a juvenile delinquent, the judge must consider a disposition of the case that represents the least restrictive option consistent with the needs and best interests of the youth and the community. A key difference between the adult system is that a finding of juvenile delinquency does not result in a criminal conviction. Rather, the goal of the juvenile process in family court is to ensure that the final disposition of a case meets the needs and best interests of the young person as well as the community's need for protection. While the passage and implementation of Raise the Age has been a remarkable achievement for the city of New York, we are continuing to see, and we're continuing to see positive imp impacts of the law. We continue to work on issues as they emerge. At MOCJ, we've worked diligently over the past months to address these issues and make necessary system improvements in response. For example, we worked with NYPD, Office of the Court Administration, District Attorneys, Probation, and Law Department to reduce the time between arrest to arraignment and to find another entrance point for, uh, for the Bronx Youth Part, and to help implement the newly enacted Assessable Magistrate Removal Law. The work continues each and every day and is a result of an ongoing collaboration among system partners throughout the city to realize the goals of Raise the Age. Raise the Age has undoubtedly led to fewer youth being arrested, fewer youth being detained, and better, more youth-centric conditions for the smaller number of youth that are in our custody. 
I would like to thank all the advocates who fought for years for this reform. Uh, this work is possible because of your efforts. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Lansman, Chair Powers, uh, members on the Committee of Criminal Justice and the Committee on the Justice System. My name is William Barnes, and I am an Assistant Chief in the New York City Department of Correction. I appreciate this opportunity to update the Council on the Department's effort to support Raise the Age mandate and discuss our transition out of Horizon Juvenile Detention Center. The Department remains committed to providing a safe and stable environment for all those who live at and work in Horizon and are proud to support ACS as they take over the primary responsibility for the safety and security of our young people at the Horizon facility. Horizon opened its doors on September 27, 2018 and has always been jointly administered by the Department and ACS per the RTA. This, is, this has been an important and strategic partnership that enabled the Department to ensure the safety of youth and supporting ACS in its operations. Prior to the transfer of adolescents to Horizon, the Department oversaw important renovations to the building itself that aimed to create an overall deinstitutionalized feel within the facility. Throughout this renovation process, the Department regularly liaised with the State Commission on Corrections, OCFS, in order to achieve operational compliance in accordance with state guidelines. Since beginning joint operations, Horizons offered the Department an opportunity to support our young people in our care in a manner more consistent with their developmental needs. In accordance with juvenile justice best practices, Horizon provides detained adolescents with living quarters that resemble a more home-like setting rather than an adult institutional facility. The correction officers who staff Horizon have dedicated themselves to learning new practices but also have been working hard to support ACS in creating a safe and secure environment for the young people in our care. For example, the officers receive extensive training on the new Raise the Age policies. They were all trained on PREA, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards for youth offenders population and have all received thorough training on safe crisis management. Following 13 months of joint operation, the department will largely transfer out of Horizon in December of this year and remain solely to provide perimeter security and manage the control room. The department will also maintain an adolescent response team that will respond only to incidents involving pre-RTA youth. The department is prepared to maintain staffing in this manner until the last pre-RTA youth leaves Horizon, which we are aiming for the early fall of 2020. Following this departure, the department will continue to support security operations at Horizon through annual inspections as required by the Raise the Age law. In preparation for the transfer, the department began working with ACS, Youth Development Specialists, also called YDS, as early as June of this year. As part of this engagement, the department coordinated with ACS to transfer knowledge on best practices and lessons learned throughout the operation of the facility over the past year. Since then, the department has ceded operational control of residential halls to ACS in a gradual manner beginning in September. As part of the transition plan, the department staff assigned to Horizon have been transitioning to other posts on a rolling basis. There will be no layoffs as a result of the department's transition out of Horizon and upon returning to the post at our adult facilities, correctional officers will receive refresher training in adult core correctional best practices. Um, the department remains committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of the youth housed at Horizon. DOC and ACS undertook this historic, unprecedented reform efforts over the course of just 18 months with no blueprint, and though we have tried to plan for a seamless transition as possible at every step of the way, there was always the understanding that there would be challenges. The next phase of the transition out of Horizon, which will involve a significant reduction in DOC staff and presence at the facility, I would like to thank Warden Ada Presley and all the officers and non-uniform staff assigned to Horizon for their tireless efforts, for their dedication to the young people in their care. 
and after more than a century of treating 16 and 17 year olds as adults, we are all now part of a monumental shift in correctional practice in the New York City that will benefit young people for generations to come. Thank you for your hard work and for your service. Council Member Powers and Council Member Lansman and members on the Com Criminal Justice and Cr Criminal Justice Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you this morning. I will now turn to my colleagues at ACS to continue the administration's testimony. Thank you. Before you start, let me just mention that we've been joined by the Majority Leader Lori Cumbo from Brooklyn and Council Member Andy Cohen from the Bronx. Debbie, Debbie, Debbie. Oh, sorry, Council Members Debbie Rose from Staten Island and Carlina Rivera from Manhattan. Thank you. Good morning, Chairs Lansman and Powers and members of the Committee on the Justice System and Criminal Justice. I am Sarah Hemeter, the Acting Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Youth and Family Justice at the New York City Administration for Children's Services. I am joined today by Charles Parkins, Deputy Associate Commissioner for Detention. I am very pleased to be testifying before you today about ACS and our implementation of Raise the Age. While long overdue, as of October 1st of this year, we have officially raised the age of crim criminal responsibility to 18 years old. All newly arrested 16 and 17 year olds are now treated as juveniles in the justice system. It has been an honor to be at ACS working collaboratively with so many partners during the planning and implementation of Raise the Age. ACS and DYFJ have made significant strides to improve the lives of children and families involved in the juvenile justice system with a special focus on keeping young people strongly connected to their communities. Through our collaboration with numerous city partners, including the NYPD, probation, the Department of Education, the Department of Correction, and the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, as well as the City Council, advocates, and providers, we have improved the prospects of justice-involved youth while enhancing public safety outcomes for everyone. ACS detention. ACS, along with our partner agencies and City Hall, engaged in extensive planning and implementation efforts to be ready for both the first phase of Raise the Age implementation for the 16-year-olds and the second phase of Raise the, Raise the Age implementation for 17-year-olds. In anticipation of Raise the Age implementation, ACS completed renovations to our detention facilities, while adding extensive programming, educational, and vocational options for older youth. We also ensured that we would have the necessary capacity for juvenile delinquents, juvenile offenders, and adolescent offenders, and created a new job title, Youth Development Specialist, or YDS. ACS was ready for Raise the Age implementation. Horizon Juvenile Detention Center has been certified as a specialized juvenile detention center, which has housed the 16 and 17 year old youth who transferred from Rikers Island on October 1st, 2018, and any 17 year old youth charged with crimes between October 1st, 2018 and September 30th, 2019, who were ordered to be detained. Our, our oversight agency, the Office of Children and Family Services, refers to these youth as pre-raise the age youth because while they are housed in a juvenile facility, they are still being prosecuted as adults in the court system. As required by law, ACS and the Department of Correction have been collaborati collaboratively operating Horizon. Prior to the October 1st, 2018 effective date, 93 youth transferred from Rikers Island to Horizon. Since last October, no juvenile has been detained at Rikers Island. Newly arrested 17-year-olds who are still prosecuted as adults for the past year have also been detained at Horizon. ACS has housed 419 unique pre-raise the age youth at Horizon this past year. As of October 31st, 2019, there were 40 pre-raise the, pre the age youth at Horizon, only two of whom were part of the original 93 youth. To ensure proper staff proper staffing at both Crossroads and Horizon, ACS has been aggressively recruiting, hiring, and training multiple classes of YDS. To date, ACS has hired over 600 YDS. ACS worked with the Department of Correction and the unions to develop a phase plan to introduce YDS to Horizon over a period of six months. Starting in April 2019, we began by bringing YDS supervisors to Horizon to observe operations. We intentionally assumed responsibility for direct care in multiple stages so that the transition would be seamless and orderly for both the youth and the staff. 
As of today, there are 170 ACS YDS at Horizon managing all 10 halls. ACS assumed full management of the final hall on November 15, 2019. ACS is, is on track to assume primary operational control of Horizon by January 2020. Some of the Rikers youth and pre raised the age youth can still be detained at Horizon until October 1, 2020. Until all of those youth leave the facility or turn 18 years old, DOC will need to remain on site in some capacity as required by the state. As a result, after January 2020, there will be a small contingent of DOC officers on site performing limited functions related to safety and security. As of October 21st, 2019, 17-year-olds are, are also now treated as juveniles in the justice system. This means that if they are arrested and brought to court, their cases are handled either in family court or the youth part of Supreme Court. If they are detained as a juvenile delinquent, they are now housed at crossroads. For now, any newly charged and detained juvenile delinquent, juvenile offender, or adolescent offender is detained at crossroads. While the population of pre-raised age youth at Horizon is rapidly decreasing, we anticipate that the population at Crossroads will continue to increase for the foreseeable future, as it is the only secure detention or specialized, deter specialized secure detention facility for newly detained youth. In preparation, ACS is in the process of having some halls at Horizon certified by the state to be specialized secure detention, or SSD, and thus be able to house adolescent offenders. The halls we are seeking to have certified as SSD will be separate from where the pre raise the age youth are housed. Ultimately, once all of the pre raise the age youth leave Horizon in the coming months, we will have more flexibility to house detained youth closer to their homes and communities in the two, detention, two secure detention facilities, given that one facility is in the Bronx and the other is in Brooklyn. This will also give us greater flexibility with regard to population separation for safety purposes. Youth at Horizon and Crossroads attend school on site at DOE Passages Academy, and they have access to extensive offerings of vocational training and ACS's large array of contracted programming, as well as on site health and mental health services, all of which is intended to provide the therapeutic and educational interventions that improve the youth's well being and life outcomes. This past summer, youth at Crossroads and Horizon participate in the participated in the Department of Youth and Community Development's Summer Youth Employment Program, which enabled them to work, earning $15 an hour during the summer for up to 25 hours a week in the facilities and then in the community post-release. ACS has a wide variety of pro programming available for youth in detention. This includes cu Cure Violence Credible Messenger programs, Carnegie Hall Music, and various art programs. ACS has a chaplain at both detention facilities, and all youth can participate in religious services and individual ministry. One of our newest offerings is Sprout, Sprout by Design, an urban farming program at both Horizon and Crossroads, as well as some of our close-to-home placement programs. At the detention sites, youth have gardens and learn how to make healthy snacks using, using fresh produce from the garden. Providing youth in detention with daily opportunities for large muscle and large muscle exercise and space for recreation is essential. All youth at both facilities have the opportunity for outdoor activities. The outdoor space at Crossroads is complete and includes basketball courts, grassy areas, sprinklers for hot days, and space for other outdoor recreation activities. As has always been the case, youth at Horizon are able to access the interior courtyard and the patios in the housing units. In April, a temporary outdoor basketball court was completed, and in August, a permanent full-size basketball court was also completed. There is a large grassy area now available at Horizon, which the youth at Horizon were able to use for the Turkey Bowl, a flag football tournament on Thanksgiving. The youth who are placed in detention are often among the highest needs youth in the city and have experienced various traumas prior to detention. Through our partnership with New York City Health and Hospitals, youth receive comprehensive psychiatric, psychological, and behavioral health services delivered by skilled clinicians from Bellevue Hospital and Correctional Health Services. DYFJ uses the New York City model within our secure detention system. Adapted from the nationally recognized Missouri Youth Services Institute, or MISE model, 
The New York City model is a therapeutic approach for working with youth in the juvenile justice system. Facilitated small group interactions are at the core of this group process model and include components of positive youth development and cognitive behavioral therapy to help youth make positive and long-lasting changes in their thinking and behavior. In addition, we continue to train our staff on safe crisis management and have expanded our contract with the developer to include monthly on-site trainings for staff to practice and apply de-escalation skills to manage conflict. Close to home. In 2012, the state and city partnered to create Close to Home, New York City's juvenile justice placement system, where adjudicated juvenile delinquents are placed in residential programs near their homes, schools, and communities. Our Close to Home non-secure and limited secure placement residents are located at 30 sites throughout the city and in Dobbs Ferry and are run by seven nonprofit provider agencies. Close to Home is grounded within a child welfare framework and all of our providers are deeply experienced in serving the complex needs of our youth. Despite raising the age of criminal responsibility for 16-year-olds last October, ACS has seen a decline in Close to Home census. Close to Home placements declined 43% in the first nine months of Raise the Age. As of November 25, 2019, there were 101 youth in Close to Home placement with an additional 40 youth on aftercare, where they continue to be supervised by ACS and the provider, but are at home in the community. ACS currently contracts for 294 beds in close to home. With 17-year-olds adjudicated as juvenile delinquents now eligible for close to home, we expect to see the census start to increase. We are working with MOCJ to monitor, monitor the situation closely and ensure we have sufficient capacity. All close-to-home programs offer structured residential care for youth in small, supervised, and home-like environment. In contrast to traditionally larger juvenile placement facilities, close-to-home programs have been intentionally designed to ensure participation in program while preserving the safety and security of youth, staff, and the community. Close-to-home allows for work to occur simultaneously with the youth, the family, and the community to ensure that factors that led to the juvenile justice system involvement are addressed before the youth returns to the community. In partnership with the Department of Probation, ACS has adopted a risk needs responsivity framework and an evidence-based assessment tool, the Youth Level of Service, or YLS, to guide our intervention and ensure we reduce the likelihood to recidivate. Each close to home program is required to implement an evidence-based therapeutic program model that serves as the primary mechanism of behavioral support. Through the chosen program framework, youth address their interpersonal relationships, communication skills, and emotional regulation. Having youth close to their families allows for the inclusion of the youth's family at every level of intervention. In Close to Home, we use family team conferencing as we believe it is critical to engage the youth's family in all decisions and challenges the youth may be facing. Before youth are discharged home, they and their family must have demonstrated readiness for reunification. Youth returning to the community receive aftercare supervision from their close to home provider. The goal of close to home aftercare is to build on this, the skills youth acquire while in placement and help develop a network of support that will allow them to succeed in the community. While in placement, youth form pro positive trusting relationships with caring adults. These relationships are critical to facilitate each youth's growth, skill development, and progress as they learn new ways of thinking and changing their behaviors. On aftercare, residential providers build on these existing relationships with youth along with their broader agency resources and relationships with community-based organizations to supervise youth in the community with support from ACS to ensure that a youth's needs are being met. Intro 1628-2019 amends the juvenile justice quarterly and annual data reports for detention and close to home to include additional components, many of which are related to raise the age. ACS appreciates the city council's interest in amending the data report to include data points specifically related to raising the age of criminal responsibility. The proposed, res the proposed legislation includes some data elements ACS does not have access to would change the reporting requirement to be monthly, which would be incredibly onerous for ACS, and also include some disaggregation requirements that are too small for ACS to be able to report on due to confidentiality. 
In addition, the proposed bill includes data reporting requirements for the Department of Probation and MOCJ, which ACS cannot speak to. However, ACS is committed to maximum transparency with the Council and the public about our juvenile justice programs, and we look forward to discussing the proposed legislation more thoroughly with the bill's sponsors so that we can update the current reports to include, include Raise the Age in a meaningful and helpful manner. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss ACS's efforts to implement Raise the Age. ACS is looking forward to continue, continuing to work with the city agencies, the city council, the providers, the advocates, the state, and most importantly, the youth and their families to both strengthen the juvenile justice system and reduce the number of ju justice-involved youth. We are happy to answer your questions. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I want to focus on a, a couple of areas and then um, turn it over to my uh, colleagues. Uh, let's start with the numbers. You know, we visited the facility, we visited Horizon uh, yesterday, and speaking for myself, I was very impressed with the dedication and the professionalism of the staff, both ACS, Department of Corrections, the really important people, and the people on the, the ground. Um, and I thought the, uh, the description that we were given of, of the programming that's available and, and meeting the, the I, think it was, I think we met the, actually the assistant principal at the, at the school, um, gave me personally a lot of confidence that everyone is really trying to do the, the right thing. And of course, it's easier to do that as the population has continued to, to decline. With that said, um, you will recall that I asked very pointedly what the numbers were, what the metrics were, particularly as they relate to um, violence, use of force, fights, et cetera. And our colleague, Council Member Lewis, was very interested uh, in issues related to the programming and the educational opportunities, and, and perhaps she'll, she'll touch more on that. But the statistics that we were able to put together, including some that were released either this morning or last night, are not good. <coughs> and I want to review them with you, and you can tell me, someone, what you make of them. So, at Horizon, use of physical restraints in detention on youth in, youth in custody, which is a fancy way of saying use of force. In the first quarter that the transition occurred, which would have covered October 2018, there were 155 use of force incidents reported. No, that was the first quarter of the transition. We all know that it was not the smoothest transition in the history of transitions. The next quarter, the numbers got better. This would be FY19, the third quarter, covering the period January through March of 2019. There were 99 incidents of use of force, down from 155. That's good. But then the next quarter, covering April through June of 2019, the number was up to 133. The most recent quarter, which was posted, I'm told, 9 a.m. this morning, covering uh, July through September of 2019, the number is up to 181, going in the wrong direction in dramatic fashion. Another metric, Fights. The quarter in which the transition occurred, there were 109 fights. <coughs> the three subsequent quarters, including the, the quarter whose information was released this morning, have been 71, 70, and 71. Down from 109, that first tumultuous quarter, but no measurable progress in reducing the number of fights. So um, what can you tell us, and this, 
is consistent with the federal monitor's uh, reporting, which I alluded to in my opening statement. So, when it comes to use of force at Horizon based on the Department of Corrections, or excuse me, I think ACS's own reporting, the number's going in the wrong direction, and when it comes to fights, no progress seems to be being made. So who would like to respond to that and tell me what's going on? Let me take a piece of that because there's a, the, the transition has been, um, it's, it, there's a big story to it uh, in terms of the monumental change that um, our agencies went through to do this. Um, so the first piece you mentioned was the 155, right? Um, the incidents when we first moved in were generally driven by our first month uh, at Horizon, right? We, we set to create Horizon to have less of an institutional feel than anything an adolescent would find on Rikers Island. Um, however, some of those things just weren't appropriate um, for, the, for the group that moved in, right? Um, windows that you could see through created issues in our corridors. Uh, school chairs that were not connected to the ground um, turned into weapons. Um, so those are things, and, and how we moved um, the youth through the hallways of a new building, you know, we had to adjust our practices. Um, so, you know, that, that was a big driver of our incidents right up front. Um, we, we made drastic improvements right away, um, which, you know, are attributed to those decreases. Uh, and then over the summer, you know, our first summer um, without school, but also um, had a very challenging uh, group of individuals uh, in custody at Horizon. Uh, 17 youth, uh, all having 10 or more incidents each, driving 225 incidents from those just 17 youth um, and trying to implement new strategies and behavioral plans um, to address those. And we've been working hand in hand with the federal monitor and our state oversights to figure out a new uh, behavioral plan um, that I think is going into effect uh, just shortly with Strive Plus, which I can let my ACS colleagues talk about. Um, but certainly, you know, that um, recently as we go through a new transition in turning um, the housing areas over to ACS, you know, we go through, we are going through um, yet another testing period of the facility and the staff and the youth um, and uh, in incidents do happen as, as a result of those transitions. Good morning and thank you. Uh, my, my colleague is absolutely correct. Uh, the, the just, youth just do, just, I met you yesterday, but just introduce yourself because sure. you haven't testified yet. Thank you. I, I'm, the, uh, I'm Charles Parkins. I'm the Deputy Associate Commissioner for Detention Services with ACS. So as I was mentioning, my, my colleague is absolutely correct around uh, youth responding to changes and challenges in an environment like this. So um, it, it's, it's our job to adjust to those changes and respond in such a way to reduce the number of incidents as they occur. What we have seen is that we have provided a number of um, programs and implement implementations in place to address behaviors as they come about. A number of the incidents that occur are um, a small percentage of the youth who um, have some significant challenges and require additional attention. So uh, typically, many of our incidents are provided by a, uh, a few youth who, are, who have some challenges. We, we've implemented um, strategies around STRIVE, which is our behavioral management system, which provides both positive incentives and holds youth accountable for their behavior in such a way that they can earn rewards uh, that are meaningful and appeal to them to guide that. And I think much of the success that we have seen has been around youth who um, value those rewards and have bought into the system. Tip, but there are youth who um, have different values and uh, we have to adjust our system to account for those. So it, it's a constant balancing that we're doing to, to manage those types the, of behavior. The, the problem is, it seems just from the data where you have use of force uh, for the last quarter, ending in September, double, 181, double, almost, the amount of force that was used in that, in that first full quarter that Horizon was, was transitioned over. And, and so um, I'm not a 
either a juvenile or adult corrections professional, but it, the data seems to say that the way that you are, um, one of the ways that you are adjusting is a dramatic, dramatic increase in the amount of force, use of force incidents used against the, the detainees. And so I, I can't, I don't have metrics for, maybe you do, but you know, how many students, uh, students, how many detainees are, are participating in this program or that, and, 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 and its effect on, on creating a, a more stable, safe environment. But I do have metrics for how many times the, the, the institution used force, use of physical restraints and detention on youth in custody, and it is, it is a dramatic increase. So I, I look at this and I'm like, well, this is an institution where they're, they're, they're kind of roughly cracking down on, on the youth there to maintain order. So neither of your, your responses really address that. I don't know what you can say to address it because the numbers are what they are, unless, unless I'm missing something. I don't know that you're missing something here. The, the I, I think I think it's important to understand the context of what we do provide for youths. So um, we have our YDS who have been slowly going into these facilities and, and taking over units starting in August. But uh, it, you know we have the responsibility to make sure that the facility is safe for the youth. And uh, we do so through a variety of different ways. As I discussed earlier, having a solid behavior management system in place is one of those ways. But we also provide other uh, skills and techniques that our staff have to learn. Let me, let me put it this way, OK? Sure. The, f the, the, the data is what the data is. The number of use of force incidents are what they are. What would you say is the, the main failure or shortcoming or gap, whatever whatever gloss you want to put on it, in all the other things that you do, all the other wonderful things that you do, that is resulting in still there need being, a, being a need to use force as often as the data says that you must. Um, Councilman, you're right. The, the numbers do reflect an increase in, in use of force. Um, I want to say for the record that the uh, department has a use of force policy in which force is always a last resort, and when it needs to be applied, it should be applied in a manner as least restrictive as possible. But I think it's important to understand that force is not always necessarily linked with a violent act. In fact, the vast majority of times where staff is using force, it could be simply just pushing or guiding one youth away from another youth. That is under our guidelines, a use of force. I think sometimes people, I think the more important question you, you, you had, Councilman, was why is the force necessary? So if there's fighting, what is causing the fights? What's driving the numbers of the fights? Is it you know, a security risk group um, um, connotation to it? Is it a poor impulse control secondary to a mental health need? Um, th those are the, those are the uh, driving factors that cause fights and that which cause sometimes staff to have to intervene. But speaking strictly to the numbers of the force, as you said, um, we have a fiduciary responsibility to prevent staff, or I'm sorry, in, incarcerated individuals from harming each other. So if there is a fight about to happen and it's escalating and we're doing verbal interpersonal communication skills to try to de-escalate that and it's about to um, go down, if an officer simply puts his arm on, on a youth and pulls him I, away, I, that's I, a youth. I, I get it and I understand. Yeah. Not so I just don't want, I don't want I to, I, I think it's important to understand that Although I'm not disputing that there is a large number that you have pointed out, I think it's extremely important for two salient points. One, the driving factor for use of force is related to a disproportionate small number of uh, residents that were responsible for a majority of those force incidents. And we've worked very closely with health and hospitals, CHS, ACS, to develop plans to address and attenuate their concerns. And the other segment of that, Councilman, is that force is not always linked to someone just refusing a direct order and staff you know, putting them against the wall and cuffing them. That, that is, of course, that's force, but there are majority of the time is we're, we are literally pushing people apart, separating people. 
and we have no injuries to staff or residents, and that is still a use of force that must be investigated. I, I understand that not every use of force is a use of force. Correct. Right? I get it. And I, accepting both for the sake of argument, and I have no reason not to accept that it's true, that you only use force as a last resort. My question then is, why is the other things that is, are going on in the, in the facility, the, the programs, the strategies, et cetera, what about them is not working or that needs to improve so that there are fewer use of force incidents each quarter rather than, than more? And I don't know that that is an answer that the Department of Corrections can provide, but, uh, you know. What is the ACS stuff not working that the Department of Corrections folks have to do their thing? So I think over the scope of time that we have here, there's been a variety of programs that have been put in place. So we follow the same trends that you do as we look at data and we respond accordingly in, in, in an effort to address those issues and get ahead of them as, they, as, as the youth change and youth evolve. I think one of the important metrics here also is that uh, the injury data associated with these types of incidents is, is very, very low. You know, it, it's important for us to get involved early and... The, uh, sorry, just so I understand. The injury data associated with use of force? Correct. Incidents? Correct. So okay. the injuries for uh, that resulted in the fights or the injuries that resulted in from a use of force is, is, is very low and is, is incredibly important data to, to contextualize the incidents as they occur. Our involvement early on, which sometimes does result in a use of force or a physical restraint in the ACS world, um, is an effort to reduce the chance that a youth is injured. I, I would also just like to say that, you know, as, as we are looking at these numbers as well, we have put in a, um, a number of things if, uh, to address, help staff address these issues, such as coaching, um, and we, we, are, we have a new um, MISE coach, which is the evidence-based model that brings the whole team together to process with the youth um, things that are happening to try to prevent these incidents from becoming incidents in the first place, um, and then addressing it once incidents also occur. So, so as we are looking at this as well, we are thinking about what are the other things that we can do to drive those numbers down. Um, Strive is one of those things that, that um, Chuck talked about, but also um, the coaching for the staff, the evidence-based model coaching. We have supervisors who are also getting coaching as well um, so that we can try to drive these numbers down as well. All right, well, I, you know, the <laughs> Numbers are what the numbers are, and they're heading in the wrong direction. They've been heading there for, for you know, two full quarters, which is which is six months. Um, let me ask you about Crossroads. Uh, same issue. Uh, this is ACS data. Use of physical restraints and detention on youth in custody, which I understand in at Crossroads is a little different from how it's measured at at Horizon. But either way, every quarter since the transition to Horizon at Crossroads has seen an increase in the, quote, use of physical restraints and detention on youth in custody. From 226 in the quarter when the transition occurred to 247 the next quarter, 357 the quarter after that, 396 the last quarter ending September 19th. And then I'll just note also fights and altercations between youth in custody for the last quarter, ending September 19th, um, it jumped from a, it jumped to 100 from the prior quarters being 15 and, and 39 and 53. So I, we didn't visit Crossroads. We didn't weren't able to have that time yesterday. What's going on there? So we run a sorry. We have some of the same issues at Crossroads as we do with Horizon. It's a very similar population of youth with a, with a growing increased number of individuals and a changing population uh, on a daily basis at times. Again, we are, we're moving forward with our 
with our heavy hiring practices to get a large number of YDS available. We're providing a, um, a large retinue of training to those staff so that they can respond to the youth. We're providing supportive services to our supervisory staff, um, such as the MISE coaches, such as building coaching competency uh, to support a uh, environment so staff can, re can respond to the youth. But we do have a growing population as well uh, that is a changing population. We could have 10 youth come in today and 10 youth leave tomorrow. And as, um, as my colleague mentioned earlier, oftentimes the number of incidents that we have are uh, represented by a very small population of the youth. I would get, if we're talking about a one quarter bump, I would get that. Mm -hmm. but, but at Crossroads, we're talking about every single quarter, it is continuing to go up. Every institution has to deal with a small number of detainees or inmates, as the case may be, who cause more problems. Um, you know, in my own council district, small number of constituents that take a lot of my time, let's put it that way. You gotta figure out a way to, how to manage that and, and deal with that. And it just seems like, like that's not occurring because the numbers are going at crossroads, like month after month, the wrong direction. Well, we do look at the data in, in two different ways. What you're seeing now is more of the trend data that we can look back on and see how we did or see how trends worked. But um, most of our work comes in our daily huddles, right? Our, our reviewing of the youth in real time with a multidisciplinary team approach, with education, with mental health, with medical services, with all the partners at the table reviewing the behaviors of the individual youth and working on individual <coughs> behavior plans to address those serious behaviors and sometimes non-serious behaviors representing uh, what actions occur on a daily basis. It's, it's a constant management issue. Uh, to be able to identify triggers for youth who are coming in uh, trauma, who have had you know, years and years of experiences that have you know, led to their current behaviors. And in a short, few short days, we are trying to diagnose those issues, identify those triggers, develop plans to address to those behaviors and uh, ensure that we're not placing youth in, in, in a unit where, where they may have a problem with another youth. And we have to then change them and move them to another youth hall where we have to make sure those same problems don't exist with different youth. So it is a, uh, we use the real-time data in terms of what's happened in the previous hours to um, develop plans to safely manage youth. All right, I had other topics, but um, this one took a lot of time, so. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm going to spend just a couple minutes because I do want to allow my colleagues to ask some questions and then I'll come back and, um, uh, and follow up. But just picking up where Councilmember Lanspin left off, so I'll extend his time. Uh, um, you know, just on use of force for a second, and this is just a kind of ongoing issue that I have, is we, it's downplayed when the numbers are bad often. And when it starts trending in the right direction, we hear it celebrated as sort of a reduction use of force. I'm not isolating this to anybody who's sitting here. It's just a constant. It seems like it's when it's bad, we define use of force. And I understand it's not every single, it's not all bad. It's, 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 it's occasionally, it's, it's necessary to separate people from fights. And it does not always represent re use of force in the way that the, the words might lead one to. But it does seem often that that is, uh, in, it's interpreted the way that uh, the agencies decide to interpret it, uh, whether in, 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 in depending on which way that number is going. But the number is going up. ACS is, is taking control and sort of moving into these facilities. And as that's happening, we're seeing just not the numbers go, and I, I think we'd all still agree is the wrong direction. And for one reason or another, in the wrong direction. So we we, we all agree there's a problem, the numbers lay that out. What, give us the game plan for the next, let's say, if, if Councilmember Lansman and I are, and other colleagues are here in a year having a, another hearing, what is the game plan between now and in the, next, in the following year 
to improve those numbers? What are the measures that ACS and for the time being DOC and Mach J and all agencies here are gonna put in place? What programs, what services, staffing? Tell us what is the plan moving forward and what should we be expecting for our next conversation about raise the age implementation for improving the direction of the use of force numbers? So I, I think we've talked about some of the programs and things that we are um, putting in place to address uh, to address this issue and to Im improve the, the practice within our facilities. Um, we mentioned our STRIVE program, which is the behavioral management program for youth to hold youth accountable and making sure that all staff who are working with the youth are familiar with this program and using the program effectively um, to hold youth accountable for their behaviors and also for good behaviors and bad behaviors. Um, so that's one thing. We have also, um, as I mentioned, um, have coaches for both staff and for our managers um, or our supervisors um, to work with them one-on-one -on, -one on issues related to how they're interacting with staff and to ensure that best practices are being um, implemented uh, with the youth within the facility. Um, we, we have, um, Chuck mentioned the daily huddle, which I think is an extremely important part of our practice where we are talking as a, as a team uh, with mental health, with education, with, with the YDS who are uh, on the halls um, to address behaviors and come up with behavioral plans on a daily basis for youth. Um, we've also extended our contract with J JKM, which is our safe crisis management um, uh, provider um, to work with staff also to work with them on de-escalation techniques so that use of force does not need to happen on such a regular basis that they are using those techniques um, and making sure that that is happening with, within the facility as well. I also think in both of our facilities, um, the programming that we offer to youth um, is, is essential to keep youth active and, and not idle um, so that they are engaged um, and, and working towards something so that when they get out of the facility, there is, is a, a certificate or a job or something like that that they can look forward to. So I think there's, we're, we're looking at this on multiple fronts um, to work with staff, to work with, with the youth, um, and also with the families engaging them as well. So I think we're looking at this holistically um, in terms of how we're trying to address this. To, to further add to this, over the next year, I think you'll, one, one of the challenges that we've had is we've been moving staff from Crossroads to Horizon, so in, in large groups, which has created challenges in terms of destabilizing our treatment teams that exist on individual units um, to create opportunities and to cover units at Horizon. So over the next year, we should see those teams stabilize. Um, our success in working with youth is about building relationships, and they're able to better do that when they have uh, the same staff working with them on a regular basis. Uh, we should see a reduction in that movement, which would help helpfully re reflect in those numbers as well. Okay, I, I just will add that I think that both Councilman Lance and myself and the colleagues are looking to help fix the problem. We're not here to we're not here to be bad guys. We're highlighting what I think are concerning numbers, but do want to help fix the problem. We'll be into budget discussions and other things as we kind of enter into the new year. And I think we are both invested and are all invested in trying to re improve. The, the direction of those numbers, and I, re, and I understand uh, that the numbers aren't always reflective of what's, what it feels like, but it certainly I think if they're going in that direction, they're going the wrong direction, and I think would be, would want to be helpful to that, whether it is about programs and resources and things like that. Can we just talk about use of force? And I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to hand it off. But just on use of force, you said some are about gent you know, gentle breaking up fights and separating people. Can you tell us how many incidents of the 440 and the injuries that sustained, I think was 228 injuries sustained, how much can be classified as uh, separation or a so, quote unquote gen gentle breaking up of fights? So um, for the Department of Corrections, a use of force is uh, categorized in three categories. So in class A use of force is where there is either serious injury to a staff member or to an incarcerated individual. A class B use of force is any injury. So even if handcuffs were applied and there was some redness to the wrist, that's still an injury. 
So that's a B. And C would be where there is no injuries to staff or residents. So in, as you said, breaking up two individuals from, from fighting. Um, I, I think, as you said, I believe that the mission of, of the council and, and all the agencies here is to have safe environment for our, for our youths and to, to have them in a, in a um, facility that um, promotes the dignity of, of, the, of the individuals. Um, I think that the most important thing is um, the, the, what is causing these incidents. And as, as I think you pointed out about programming and uh, idleness abatement and uh, redirecting negative behavior. So we, we're, not, it, it, we're, not a, we're not having to use force, right? Um, I, I, I wanted to briefly touch on um, issues that, again, I'm, I, I, I would have to say, from a very macro level, why sometimes incidents in any setting go up, I, I can say that um, it's important to recognize the city has been working to um, redirect um, nonviolent offenders from coming to or having to go in, and being incarcerated. And unfortunately, um, DOC has been um, um, charged with uh, caring for individuals who have a higher propensity for uh, violence and has a, you know, and that could be attributed to their affiliation with security risk groups, which, you know, colloquially termed as gang uh, affiliation, or, um, you know, increased populations that have significant mental health challenges. And as you said, it, you know, it's, it's easy to point out a problem, but solution-wise, um, the department is working very closely with CHS, and we've created something called a PINS meeting, which stands for uh, Persons in Need of Supervision and Support. And it's something that we've never done before, but basically get into a room with the uh, mental health professionals, with um, medical professionals, with custody of different um, persons who is in charge of that particular facility, and we talk about uh, at-risk youth or at-risk uh, incarcerated individuals, and we try to come up with a real meaningful plan to address why um, there is this uh, behavior. Um, in in uh, regards to force in and of itself, the department um, is, is transitioning in a culture change of how we look at force. And I can say that we don't get allegations of force because there's very, there are, we have such a, we're hypersensitive in transparency and reporting it. So even if we separate two individuals, we're calling that force. Whereas not having someone saying, hey, you know, I think force was used, you know, we look at every single incident. No, we, I think I think we we appreciate that, and, and I know that that's we, we have this discussion outside of the juvenile system as well in terms of what force. Can, can you, you you mentioned three different categories, A, B, and C. Do you have the numbers back to the question back of yeah. of how many are categorized for A, B, and C? Yeah. So um, for, from October through about September 2019, um, in terms of um, youth on youth fights that resulted in a serious injury. Um, let's, you know. let's do use of force. Uh, That's, I think that was a question was about use of force. So it, there's, it, it's, you can't really categorize it that way exactly because um, the use of force could involve a staff or someone in custody. And so it's, it's, that, is a, that could be, um, another, that would be something we'd have to follow up with you to, to break it down like that. But in terms of fights um, with youth in custody, there have been about 10 where, where there have been over from those, um, from the number you cited. And for staff, about three. Three serious injuries or something? Staff one? over the first Over year. staff injuries and ten to individuals. Yeah. I think that Councilman Lanceman in his uh, questioning had mentioned, I think, the stats that he was talking about were a rise, I think, stability in some of the fighting, although still we'd like to see that obviously drop lower, initial spike and a lowering. But the use of force incidents were going up and I think it doubled, I think, if I'm correct from hearing his numbers. So I think we were looking for an explanation of the use of force and the categorization of some as separating people, not causing an injury, others as potentially more serious. So I, just, I want to be as transparent as possible. I have some data as it pertains to A, B, and C use of force, but that would be reflective of use of force solely by Department of Correction staff with residents to Horizon, so I don't want to give the council any misinformation that it's not representative of a cumulative number. You mean not crossroads at other facilities? Sure, right. we'll, so we'll take we'll Let's take just say there was a YDS or intervention. I don't want to give you a number, and I, I don't want to seem that I'm being disingenuous. I understand, okay, I appreciate but, that. But, you know, just in, in the interest of, of trying to address what um, you're asking, 
So in the month of November, for Department of Correction use of force, there were zero Class A uses of force. There were three Class B uses of force, and there were eight Class C uses of force, and zero allegations of force. In there was 11 uses of force in November, is that what we're saying, and for, zero, three, and eight? For Department of Correction for DOC, okay. and youth at Horizon, not counting any YDS intervention, and I provided these numbers just because I understand. I, I, appreciate, I, I wanted to you know, be as transparent as possible. I, I appreciate the transparency. Does ACS have numbers for their staff? Uh, we don't have that information available today, but we'd be happy to provide it in the future. Okay. Okay, yep. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, Councilmember Lesson has to run to a vote. I'm going to hand it over to Councilmember Lewis, Councilmember Cohen, and then Councilmember Rose. Th thank you for the answers. Good morning. Um, thank you, Chairs Lansman and Powers, for organizing this um, oversight hearing. We're just going to continue the narrative now of excessive force. One of my questions was answered, but I want to go a little bit more in depth. Um, how are services of the Cure Violence organizations being utilized to de-escalate the incidents of ex excessive force? So I heard JKM was one of the organizations used. Sorry, JKM is the Safe Crisis Management okay. um, that deal with using restraints, not okay. Cure Violence. So how are Cure Violence organizations utilized to assist with incidents of excessive force to de-escalate? So we have, a, we have providers that come in to help um, provide some crisis uh, de-escalation and work with our staff and work with the youth to get them to talk about these issues to help reduce the propensity for violence in the facilities. So we are using um, providers to do this, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's one of the tools being used um, mm -hmm. to help address behaviors. Um, there's other tools that we use as well, really trying to engage youth, keep them occupied, keep them interested by developing robust programs that they may be interested in as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that has drawbacks as well. We have youth who have never experienced certain programs who are now uh, a little afraid or, you know, that their interest might not be there. And, and we have some that are developing interest. So it's really trying to have a, a large cadre of services for kids that, that are across the spectrum in terms of engagement uh, to, help, um, to help stabilize them and make them uh, safer when they're in our custody. For those that don't feel safe, um, how many incidents of excessive force um, used on the youth that were injured prevent them from actually attending school or participating in programs? Do you have a number? I don't know that I have that information, but I can follow up. But to clarify, you want to know how, how many incidents of excessive force? How many incidents of excessive force, force that force caused injuries on students prevent them from attending preventing school? Preventing them from going to school. Okay. To Passage I, I Academy. Follow up on that. Yeah, if we could have that number, that would be great. Um, how many hours are provided for therapeutic and behavioral services for youth? Yesterday we went on a tour and it appeared, I heard in conversation, that some youth were experiencing depression, loss from family. So how many hours are being provided for therapeutic behavioral services and how does STRIDE help with that? There's, there's two components. So STRIVE is a more broad um, token economy system that's used to guide youth around specific behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, we, they earn points for demonstrating <laughs> safety or respect uh, throughout the day, and the, and the day is broken up into multiple components. Those points then um, are awarded to them in those moments, and at the end of the day, they are totaled up, and that allows them to move to different levels within the STRIVE system. Each level within the STRIVE system allows the youth to have greater access to different um, privileges or rewards that they might find to be high value. And of course, that value is different from every youth. Your question regarding uh, mental health services or behavioral health services, um, I can find out if we have some minimum numbers that are applied across the board for you in terms of hours, but they are highly structured to the individual. Mm -hmm. so that each individual's needs are being met. And uh, as you can imagine, um, some have a greater need than others, uh, and, and we have a, a large variety of services for mental health um, using um, correctional health services as well as um, Bellevue 
to provide um, psychologists, psychiatrists, and uh, mental health counselors to be able to meet those needs. All right, that would be helpful if we got those numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Rivera. Thank you so much. Thank you. A couple questions. Um, for LGBTQ, TGNC, and B youth, typically we've seen special housing units, but how do you support those who identify? Youth are able to be placed where they identify, on housing units where, as they identify. Also in the testimony, um, ACS, you mention, through your partnership with New York City Health and Hospitals, youth receive comprehensive psychiatric, psychological, and behavioral health services delivered by skilled technicians, clinicians, excuse me. What does that look like and how do you use those sessions and that information to help build out your programs and services? Could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. I apologize. It says that you offer comprehensive psychiatric health services. And so when we're talking a, a, about youth and their development and how they identify, how does that um, inform your programs and services and the way that you keep your facilities? Sure. So we have, um, we work directly with Bellevue and uh, we have some training that's provided, uh, target training. Um, that's provided directly to staff and to youth to help kind of bridge those gaps, uh, inform the staff on uh, how to provide adequate services to youth with uh, specific needs. And of course, you know, the, the basis of all our working with kids is just constant communication uh, and engaging and building a rapport and a relationship with the youth. So they, they feel comfortable to have those conversations with us uh, so they feel safe and we can meet those needs. In the close to home mention, I, you know, one of the things that I think we, we have uh, commented on was trying to get our hands on the data. And we understand that there's actually a piece of legislation that we're hearing to help us with some of this data and statistics and some of this information. But I want to ask specifically about close to home and the family component and how they participate. So you mentioned in your testimony that youth uh, forms positive trusting relationships with adults. So can you, can you tell us how many of those young people have supportive family networks? I imagine not all of them have family that they can talk to, which is heartbreaking. And how do you also facilitate the, that cultivation of trusted relationships, especially I'm curious to, about law enforcement and, and those interactions? So uh, there's a couple of things, I think, in that question. Um, the first is the family engagement. Um, and close to home, we start working with the family immediately. Um, and in fact, when a young person is placed in close to home, um, our intake team is, is doing an assessment and gathering all the paperwork um, in terms of uh, the, the probation reports and any mental health evaluations that are, are done on the youth. Um, and, a, and a transition meeting is scheduled um, before that young person is placed in close to home. That includes the family um, and the youth um, in that conference so that everyone has an understanding of where the youth is going, what, what, the, what the process is, how long they might be there. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the testimony, there, there, we have family team conferences throughout the life of a case. There are six required family team conferences um, throughout a um, close to home case, um, including the transition conference, but also before release, there is also a transition conference. The family is invited to all of those um, conferences um, and participating in them um, as, as much as possible. And we schedule that conference around the, the family's um, availability. Um, there are also other conferences, if, if something happens in a facility, um, there are other conferences that are held as well that include the family. So the family is integral to um, the close to home placement for the youth. Um, as far as um, permanency, uh, which I think is what you were getting at in terms of youth who do not have family, um, in uh, calendar year 2018, out of 167 youth, 77% uh, of those youth were, were released to a parent or family member. 
Um, we're always trying to find uh, an adult that a young person can be released to. If it is not a, a parent, is there somebody else who can be involved, um, who wants to be involved with that young person? Um, so for the young people who do not have that, um, it, is, it's, it is sad for those youth. Um, and we do what we can to try to encourage relationships, uh, other relationships that the youth may have. Um, but some of those youth do go to foster care. Thank you um, for, for that statistic. Because you know, for these young people who are pretty much, I guess, determined by a judge to enter the ACS system, they go into a shelter system that often leaves them vulnerable to repeat offenses. And so what investments are being made by ACS to ensure that this population is being supported in the community and that they are diverted away from the kind of activity that could lead them to becoming further justice involved once they turn 18? And I ask because in, in, our, in my own district, I have ACS facilities, one, managed, one young adult system managed by Good Shepherd who's been doing it for years and, and they love their work. And we want to ensure that the community understands how much support these young people need. Mm -hmm. So if you can just address that for me. And we haven't gotten to the NYPD component. So if you could also, this is my last question, Chairs. Thank you for being gracious with time. With adolescent arrests now resulting in more dismissal and releases, how are your agencies working with NYPD to ensure, ensure that youth are being diverted away from criminal justice involvement without incarceration? And again, how are you cultivating the relationships between these youth and NYPD considering their history? Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of our collaboration with NYPD, and Mock J can probably talk to this a little bit as well, um, there, there's um, regularly scheduled meetings that happen between city agencies, NYPD, the Department of Probation, ACS, um, the courts um, that come together and discuss, raise the age implementation, but other things as well, including diversion services um, that the NYPD provides, that probation provides, that ACS provides. Um, so there is that constant collaboration among agencies that is happening. Um, we, we have um, leadership programs for youth, um, and we have that in detention and also in close to home where we are talking about um, the, the relationships that young people have with others in their community that can include the NYPD as well. Um, and, and so we're, we're, there's often a lot of work that's happening in terms of um, individual with the youth, um, but also on, a, on an agency level. Uh, and hi, my name is Shatai Floyd. I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, building off of what my colleague said, uh, Mock J in coordination obviously with the council with respect to the CTRA reforms um, has sort of led to a precipitous drop in the number of arrests of youth um, as well as detention, uh, particularly related to uh, marijuana offenses as well as uh, theft of services. Um, and also we know that NYPD has sort of been moving towards uh, issuing juvenile reports uh, in lieu of arresting youth, uh, which also results in um, the significant decline in detention at our facilities. So if, as long as we're continuing that good work, uh, we can kind of continue to see drops um, and not related to NYPD. Uh, Mock J has expanded supervised release to cover all uh, youth uh, for every number of charges um, beginning this summer. Uh, or rather last summer. And so that has sort of given judges confidence not to increase attention as well. And, and that's, that's, that's great. We, we want to make sure that we're also supporting those programs and services that have been so critical to making sure our young people have support. I just want to ask about if, if you know, the numbers are going down and we want to move away from, uh, for example, DOC being staffed at the Horizon facility by, I think it's September 2020, correct? Even though that, that's already a six month delay, but I know you're working hard. Um, I read a story in the city that said that capital dollars continue to go into the Horizon personnel facility. And we're, if we're planning on DOC not to be slated to work, to be there by September 2020, it kind of sends a signal that maybe the Department of Corrections are gonna continue, continue to be present. So is there a transition plan for, for that departure? And can yeah. you speak to any capital investments that have currently been made? And, and thank you again to the chairs. 
Um, yeah, so uh, the department has been uh, working on a transition plan with ACS uh, since, um, for months now, and it began in mid-August when we started bringing out the first cohort of DOC officers and supervisors. Um, by the end of this calendar year, we'll have the majority of staff, of DOC staff, out of Horizon. Um, there'll be around 40 staff um, uh, there th uh, from January on through um, the time when the last um, pre-RTA youth um, will be there. But that, that's a small group um, working on three tours, so at most there might be about 10 DOC personnel in the building at any given time after January. In terms of the capital dollars. So, um, so there, the capital funds that have been um, allocated to detention, um, I'm not sure what was referenced in the in the city article that you're that you're referring to, but um, there were improvements that needed to be made at the facilities um, in terms of hardening hardening the facility, uh, putting in anti-ligature beds and things like that. That was one of that was kind of the first phase of the construction, um, and the second phase of the construction um, includes design for renovations um, to. Uh, increase the programming space for youth um, and to address some of the the building these buildings are old and so it's to improve some of the functioning within the facilities thank you so much council member Cohen uh, thank you chairs uh, good morning thank you for your testimony uh, first, I had a question related to, I guess this goes to ACS and your testimony. Uh, and forgive me, I, I just, you know, uh, I'm not knowledgeable about the, the, the confidentiality issues you, that, you, that you alluded to in reporting. Obviously, people in custody have a lower expectation of privacy than members who are not in custody, but I don't know what the issues are. What, you know, wh where, wh what do you think the challenges are in terms of confidentiality? Right, so um, specifically for the young people who are in close to home, those, those young people are governed by foster care regulations and so confident, there are confidentiality rules um, that apply in terms of um, social services law um, and so we cannot uh, release information about those youth. Um, because of the small number of youth um, who are in those facilities, some of them are only six beds. Um, by disaggregating the data, um, the way that the, the legislature, legislation is, is proposed um, could potentially identify those youth, which, and we are not able to, to identify those youth. Uh, are, are, they, are they sort of dual character, uh, categorized in that they're in foster care and in custody, or is it one or the other, or? Well, the, the close to home legislation, the way that it was written, um, the young people uh, are governed by foster foster care regu regulations as well. Um, also, the secure detention facility and the specialized juvenile detention facility are also under under the social services law. So, disaggregating those young people could potentially um, identify them as well. So, for both, so what people? Correct. Okay, I understand. Um, you know, one of the things in my experience, and I, I think Chair Lansman made reference to it in terms of constituent service, that there are a few constituents who will often occupy an enormous amount of our time. But that, that happens over and over again, where I find if I, if I go to a uh, precinct council meeting where there's one or two people who are committing, you know, really throwing a wrench into CompStat because it, 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 they're just a couple of people, and I wonder if, and I know you've talked about the programs generally, but like targeting a few, you know, you t I think you mentioned the number of 17 uh, people in your custody who were causing a significant statistical amount of the incidents. I mean, what strategies do we employ to deal with those people? And, and, and I think that that could really maybe change the, the entire co complexion of your stats if we had, uh, maybe if, if we understood it, or if there were specific strategies that identified these people early um, so that we could avoid, uh, you know, having to use force and, and, you know, have strategies that I think are effective. 
So we do identify those individuals, um, as I mentioned earlier, through our daily discussions. We actually have a, uh, for internal reporting purposes, we also have a, a monthly report that we provide with youth with serious behavioral issues so that we can work in developing individualized behavior management plans for. So oftentimes those small groups of individuals kind of uh, don't work well within our larger behavior management plan, as you mentioned. So we do target those individuals for individualized behavior management um, plans, identifying things that they value, that they, that they um, want to see, and that we can use to help encourage positive behaviors and, and more safe behaviors in our facilities. So we, clo we work also closely with our uh, mental health team in terms of working with those specific youth. So it's definitely a, a multidisciplinary approach. So you, you think that, that and, and, I, and again, I understand that the that we want to use uh, use of force in a, in a um, you know, in, in its full context. But you think that those incidences would be higher without these in individualized strategies, and that, that this is that these stats are the product of uh, of employing those individualized strategies. There's always room for improvement, and we're always striving to improve. Uh, uh, chairs, thank you very much. Council Member Rose. Thank you, Chairs. Um, the majority of these cases are, are not arraigned in youth parts, but uh, instead in regular criminal court arraignments on nights and we weekends when the youth part is not in session. According to Mock J's uh, data the, um, from the Office of Court Administration, only 32% of youth were arraigned in youth part or youth arraigned in outside of the youth part were more likely, and they were more likely to have bail set. Um, why is this number so low? And, and why um, isn't the youth part active through, throughout the night and weekends, which um, seems to be forcing young people to go through the criminal court um, during these off session hours? Uh, thank you for that question. Again, my name is Jordan Stockdale from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, it's important to note that the uh, the court system, the Office of Court Administration, is separate from the city, uh, separate from the Mayor's yeah. Office. So the hours of when judges work is not determined by the city. Two, um, night court, as you described, uh, and court on the weekend um, part of the reason why so many of the cases go to the assessable magistrate is because the offenses occur uh, during the weekend or at night and given the average arrest arraignment time, um, by the time that actually the, the youth is available for court, it's at night time. So, so um, then isn't this counter intuitive of, of what raised the age is supposed to be doing? and? Um, and if so, why haven't we looked at that and taken that into consideration? Uh, it, it seems to be um, having the exact opposite um, purpose of what we were supposed to be um, achieving. So uh, there is room for, room for improvement uh, for more youth to see, to go to the youth part. But when youth go to the accessible magistrate, um, which now can remove youth to family court. Um, the, the very next day that the um, youth part is available, youth actually go there. So the assessable magistrate isn't making a determination, one. Two, 80% of the youth designated as adolescent offenders were removed to family court uh, based on data from the first nine months of Ray ZH. So youth are being treated as youth. Uh, we do want more youth to go to uh, the, sorry, to the youth part without going to the assessable magistrate, but the assessable magistrate can remove cases, um, and youth are being removed as appropriate. But the arrest to arraignment um, times for um, raise the age youth is much longer than um, the average, according to um, the advocates. It's often more than 24 hours, which um, is then further compounded by the fact that the police department doesn't have um, facilities to detain, you know, pre-arraigned youth, that oftentimes young people are 
in, um, are, are in precincts and they are handcuffed to chairs. I mean, the stories are on and on and there's no private confidential spaces for them to talk with an attorney. You know, what are we doing to address this? Yeah, so uh, there's a few different parts to that question. Um, one, I'd like to say that according to NYPD data, the average arrest arraignment time for youth is actually less than the average adult arrest arraignment time. Uh, and the adult time actually includes misdemeanors where the youth does not. So uh, according to NYPD data, in October, uh, youth were arraigned within 17 hours, and 17 hours and nine minutes was the average time. In November, it was 16 hours and 25 minutes, so a decline. Uh, the adult citywide time for arrest arraignment was actually 18 hours and 47 minutes. So on average, arrest arraignment time for difference. youth is, right, is better than uh, for adults. However, to, to your point, there are outliers and we are analyzing common trends within the outliers so to further reduce the amount of time youth um, are held pre-arraignment. And so this is an issue that this, you know, the city thinks is important and we're working with OCA, NYPD, um, and all the relevant actors to ensure that we can continue to de decrease the arrest arraignment time. We, we have an example of doing that in the Bronx, which I'm happy to share. So if they can't bring um, a youth to, um, um, if they cannot bring a youth to arraignment via the regular detention facilities, where does that young person wait? So, uh, Which is often 24 hours. So the, the process is when a youth is arrested, they go to the precinct of the, of the you know, officer where they were arrested. Exactly. Where the, uh, crime occurred, rather. Then they go to central booking. Uh, after central booking, they generally wait in some area uh, before the, they're called to arraignment, um, at which point they're arraigned. So, so they're waiting in the precinct, oftentimes, you know, um, because there's no facility for them, they're uh, handcuffed to a chair yeah. um, without access to have uh, a private conversation or confidential conversation with an attorney? Uh, so there are special juvenile rooms within the various precincts where youth are. Um, and with respect to confidentiality and private space, we, the, the mayor's office, uh, built an interview booth in Manhattan because we heard from defenders that there wasn't sufficient space. And so we believe we solved that problem there. Uh, there are, were discussions about Queens sometimes not having uh, the right procedures in place for confidentiality. We address that with the relevant agencies. Uh, and the defenders know that at when any time- When you say you addressed it, what, how, how did you address that? In, so again, in Manhattan, we got an interview booth. In Queens, we spoke with NYPD where the defenders felt that sometimes the police officers were too close to their clients during interview during the interview process, and we asked them not to be as close, and I believe we solved that problem. Uh, again, if there, that is a, still a problem, the defenders can contact our office. They have our numbers and our you know, emails, and we would you know, work to redress that issue, but to my understanding, that is no longer an issue in Queens or in Manhattan, or, yeah. I, I think that um, there needs to be something more finite de um, decided in terms of boundaries other than asking the officer not to stand so closely. That doesn't sound like, you know, such a, a great <laughs> um, response to the lack of confidentiality. And I just wanna ask about, um, you, you mentioned that uh, um, young people were able to access the SYEP program. Um, is that open to all of the, the young people at Crossroads and Horizons, uh, or is there some criteria? And you also mentioned that it continues post-release. Could you tell me how this works? So I, I'm not sure that I have the specifics on how we identify individuals, <laughs> but we do have a process to allow you. Uh, is it open to all of the young people yeah, at the yeah. facility? Yes, it is. It's available to all young people in, in both close to home and detention. 
And what, um, and what type of jobs are you giving them? Um, well, uh, it, um, in detention? We, we, we did have a mural project that the kids worked on over the summer where they were able to work on a painting mural within the facility. Um, I know that that was part of the uh, summer youth employment program. Is this in cooperation with a community-based organization or just, um, I would have just to find within out. the facility? I would have to find out for you to see uh, which parties were involved. And uh, my last question is, um, you, you talked about, you said that um, with, with 17 year olds adjudicated as juvenile delinquents now eligible to close to home, we expect to see the census start to increase. We're working with Mock J to monitor the situation closely and ensure we have sufficient capacity. What are, um, what are the anticipated numbers of increase are you, um, are you trying to um, prepare for and are we gonna be able to meet that capacity? Uh, just to clarify, you're, you're speaking of the youth in Horizons and Crossroads. Correct? Yes. Uh, close to home. The 294 beds and close to home. Oh, close to home. So, wherever the target number. So, we have been uh, in conversations with, with Mock J about projections um, based on the arrest rates that we've seen in the first year of Raise the Age and are continuing to monitor that um, to ensure that we do have sufficient capacity at, uh, in our close to home facilities. Um, but we do have 294 beds um, as of today. Um, and if there is an increase, um, we anticipate that we will have sufficient capacity, but if we need more, that is what we are continuing to assess uh, with Mock J. How many of the 294 beds are now um, being utilized? Um, as of the testimony, it was 101, but I believe we, it's gone up a few since, since then. Um, so it, it's, a, it's been around 100, 105. And so the projected number of increase that you're I don't, anticipating? I don't have that number right now, but we can get back to you on that. I don't, I don't have it up in, but we can get you, get you that. But is it safe to assume that we feel that we can um, accommodate an increase in this numbers, in the numbers that you're talking about are being projected? Yes, we do. Thank you, Chair. Majority Leader Combo. Thank you, chairs. And I was just looking at the, um, the testimony, and it talked about uh, providing youth in detention with daily opportunities for large muscle exercise and space for recreation is essential. All youth at both facilities have the opportunity for outdoor activities with basketball courts, grassy areas, sprinklers for hot days, and space for other outdoor recreation activities. So just wanted to focus in on that because <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that the majority of uh, our youth um, involved in this system are black and Latino, correct? Would you say that, has there been any real thought in terms of culturally specific programming, in terms of the type of programming that would be relevant to black or Latino youth? Um, outside of the, the physicality of the exercise and, and outdoor activity, which is critical, but there's also the, the strong um, ability for this opportunity and, 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 and this space and time to be able to utilize that time to reconnect to their Afro and Latino base, are there organizations that you partner with? Like, let's say in my community, we have organizations like Ife Tayo, which are African rites of passage programs. We have programs such as, let's say, the West Indian American Day Carnival Association that teaches young people about their Caribbean heritage and their culture, and programs like um, in East Harlem, uh, the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute that really breaks down and shows that the heart of Latino culture is really based in African culture, and maybe if African and Latino youth could see the connections between their African heritage and their Latino heritage, they would see themselves as one versus these two groups of individuals. 
are there programming to inspire them like that? Like the film Harriet just came out. Would that be something that they would see while they're there? Would they be exposed to the autobiography of Malcolm X? Would, would they have those opportunities to reconnect in terms of their cultural identity? Because my opinion is that's essentially what the issue is about, is that you have an entire race of people, and particularly young people, who are totally disconnected from their identity. And the results are what we're seeing um, within these spaces. So, so thank you for bringing, uh, bringing that up. And, and I agree with you, this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to us. You know, one of the programs that we were really uh, excited to be able to bring on board was Freedom School, and it's been hugely popular with the youth. It was a, it's a summer-based program that's really uh, identified specific topics that are culturally relevant to the youth around reading and poetry and really engaging the kids and motivating them to read. Uh, they have uh, really bought into the program. Uh, and uh, have learned quite a bit. They have conversations around the books they read. I mean, they really, really, really get into the topics, and uh, the topics involved are often um, very much culturally relevant to the youth. Uh, additionally, as you mentioned, in terms of engaging the youth in, in outdoor activities, uh, youth are able, we have a resident council in, in our facilities, and we work with, with the youth as well to develop uh, programs that they are interested in. And um, we, if we bring in a provider, for example, that, that, that the kids really just don't really buy into, then, then we'll find a different provider for, for youth to um, participate with. So we have a number of different types of providers from the community um, to provide a, a variety of different opportunities for youth to engage in. The large muscle exercise component to that is really around that specific topic, around you know exercise and, and, and moving around and, and just really kind of, it, it's health focused. And, uh, but we, we have a large variety of other programs as well to, um, to stimulate the youth in different ways. There's the exercise of the physical body, but then there's also the exercise of your intellectual sure. capacity and how do we strengthen um, young people um, in that way. And so while that sounds like an interesting program, there are organizations that have been deeply entrenched in doing culturally competent work and are really based in it and who know it. And I, if we don't wanna just continue to have these types of same conversations, we, we ultimately have to do something very different. And there are organizations like uh, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, there are organizations um, all throughout the city that are really doing this work at a high level, everything from the Noel Pointer Foundation to uh, the International African, uh, uh, International African Arts Festival, the Central Brooklyn Jazz Consortium, so many organizations that our young people should be exposed to. And if we connect them to who they are and their identity in a really profound way, I think that we could start to have, because just to exercise their body is one thing, um, and exercising of the body is important, but it's equally and even more important to ex to exercise your intellectual capacity and exposure and the ability for them to come out of a situation like this understanding why they are in the state of affairs that they're in. How did the transatlantic slave trade happen? How did colonization happen? And if they leave these facilities without knowing those things, then they're gonna come in equally as confused as when they left with no real tools of understanding how to change their, their current situation. So thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of follow-ups on, on close to home. Um, what is the overall capacity? 294 beds. And um, how close are we to hitting that capacity? We are at 101 today. Or around there. So, so it sounds like you've got plenty of room, plenty of capacity to, to, to grow. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, and, and how many youth are currently at Crossroads? Yes, today there are 74, I believe. 
And do you have any projections for, for how that is going to grow? You know, we, we do have projections. I don't have them with me. They're projected to climb um, as the months go on, uh, higher and higher. And uh, we have developed a plan to um, that we've submitted to the state to move youth over to Horizon as well, adolescent offenders, to help reduce that um, capacity issue. OK. And, and maybe you can get us that, that projection after the hearing? Yes, we have, um, we have the projections with, with our mock check partners. Got it. All right. Anything else? Good. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Just a few follow-ups myself. Um, just, we talked about this a little bit t yesterday, and I'm sorry if I missed anybody uh, getting to questions on it, but just for staffing purposes, we discussed the uh, changeover from ACS to DOC. I, I think, just, just, and I, this is in your testimony, but I just want to clarify and have it on the record. What, can you give us the time, like expected timeline for when ACS will take, will take over in full and steps in the process in terms of staffing, in terms of transition from ACS to DOC? So, go, go ahead. So, so currently, as of right now, we have YDS on every single living unit at Horizon. So the staff that are providing the, the daily supervision of the youth are our ACS staff. We are um, assuming other points of control and we'll have full operational control of the building um, before the end of the year. This year? This year. Operational control. That doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be a DOC footprint, but we will have control of the building working with our DOC. And so, and so end of this year, DOC will, the corrections officers will be on the perimeter providing security, not in the housing units. Is that correct to say? I think that's what your testimony said. They're, They're already doing not, that now. Yeah. Yes. So as of, as of right now, there is no correction officers in any of the halls. It's completely run by ACS. Um, so what happens at the end of this year in the next three weeks? So um, what is the change over? What's the change? So okay, just just to give you a kind of a snap, yeah, kind of a snapshot. Um, the quick answer to that is we will uh, be doing the last control function for DOC will be the visit area, which we will then turn over to ACS in this in this month. And then our footprint will be further marginalized and uh, we'll be conducting perimeter tours, the sally port, um, the control room, and um, ancillary tasks. But we will have uh, a, a, no interaction with the youths on the hall, and, and except for the, right, for the, um, p uh, the response team, specifically for the pre-RTA youths. Um, so uh, just to give you a snapshot, um, Chairman Powers, as yep. of today, uh, we have 96 officers, 19 captains, three assistant deputy wardens, one deputy warden, one warden. Uh, within the month, that'll be reduced to 44 officers, 12 captains, and one deputy warden over three tours. So there, as my colleague pointed out, there might only be eight to nine DOC staff members on, on hand at any one time within the, within, between now and the end of the month. I understand, understood. And then when, when is the expected timeline when ACS has full operations? Not just not just not just what you have today and the transition, but it's I think you, you stated October of 2020 is when you expect that the that there's I think there's youth individuals that require DOC to continue to be there, and that's is that is it fair to say October 2020 is the expected timeline for when those individuals leave and therefore DOC leaves as well exits as well. Yeah, the the last youth would theoretically age out by September 30th of 2020. Because they turn 18. Correct. Correct. Okay. And the, I, I, think, I think in our budget hearings this year, DOC, although uh, certainly uh, not, the, not individuals here, had testified that it was February of 2020 when they expected that that transition would happen. It, can you explain the, the, the change in, in that opinion or if there's a distinction to make between what they said and what, what's the answer today, what, what, what that distinction is? It was because of the new admissions that came in between the time of that testimony to the time that um, the gap year ended between the phase in of um, the 17 year olds and to raise the age. So, so at that point in time, it was, it was it, the projected was February. But the last individual would age out in February yeah. of the, okay. Um, I, okay, I understood. The, I just wanted to ask about a, a 
there's a few BOC variant, Board of Corrections variances that apply, uh, I believe, to Horizon, um, including uh, one around uh, uh, mail correspondence, which has been raised to our attention about um, allowing, uh, the BOC allowing for ACS to restrict mail correspondence. And can you explain the purpose of that BOC variance? Sure, this variance allows us to identify individuals with whom correspondence is permissible and limit correspondence only to those individuals based on the safety or security of the youth, uh, the facility, or consistent with the court order. The intention of all the variances is to ensure that we have a, a youth-centered approach in working with youth at Horizon. Uh, ACS has implemented this uh, by identifying a list of individuals from whom youth, uh, the mail correspondence is prohibited or restricted based on the safety or security of the youth. Uh, the facility and or consistent with existing court orders. Uh, this is consistent with ACS's juvenile detention model and under this system there is no restriction on the amount of correspondence or language used. Correspondence is never read by the facility staff unless youth requests reading assistance and correspondence is opened in front of the youth to inspect for inappropriate contents such as paper clips, staples, or pornography. How many individuals today have a restriction on their mail correspondence at Horizon? I do not have that information in front of me, sir. Does anybody have that information? We would have to get back to you on that. Okay, and the variance, are, the variance is given to the agency to do it, and it's not based on each individual, is that correct? You don't have to go get a variance every time you want to restrict for a particular individual, is that correct? That is, that is correct. Yes. That is correct. Is, is, there a mail car, is there a restriction on mail correspondence in the city jails? No, same, the same thing applies. The, uh, contents of any letter um, is opened up in front of the incarcerated individual and purely for um, contraband reasons. Okay, but so just to clarify that answer, is there a difference between the juvenile facilities like Horizon and the city jails in terms of restrictions on mail correspondence for an individual? So I, I can obviously speak to, uh, with the um, detention facilities on Rikers Island, the only time a um, something would be restricted would be that if it would, poses a, a security threat to the institution. So for instance, if someone mailed someone a lock picking manual. But, it was, but in that case, it's, on, it's based on the item or the package, not the individual. Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. So yes. what is the difference? Why is one facility have, I'm open to hear yeah. why one is better than the other, but why is one have individuals get restricted from receiving mail and correspondence and why does, and that where the other is about a particular item that might, we, 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 we all agree. If there's a contraband in a, in a package, we want it to be recovered. I guess the question is, why is there a difference between these different facilities in terms of how mail is treated and how correspondence is treated? Right, I, I, I think the simple answer is, is that um, these are young people and it's for their protection. So if there is an inappropriate adult that they are either sending mail to or receiving mail from, we don't want that to continue. So our case management staff is, is working with the young people to come up with the, with the list of, young, of um, people they can receive mail from, just like we do with visitation, um, to make sure that the young people are, are, are protected who are in our care. So um, just, can you elaborate on that? Just, just be, we've gotten questions about this, so I want to understand. It, it's to protect an individual from receiving correspondence from an, an inappropriate adult. Can you describe what that means in more detail? I, it could also be sending the correspondence. Right. So you, you may have a, sorry, you may have an order of protection, or they may have co-defendants that they can't communicate with. So it, it's to kind of mitigate that communication. I also, I mean, just the example that I can think of off the top of my head um, are, are young people who are trafficked, um, and we don't want them to be corresponding with the people that they are being trafficked by. Um, and so I think, you know, in that instance, we would not allow for that correspondence to take place. Um, so for, for their protection, we would, would not allow that kind of correspondence. Is there an appeals process for that? I don't if you say... Oh, I, let me take a step back. Who makes a determination on that? What's the criteria? So we have, yeah. sorry, we have a, a team of case managers um, who work individually with, with the youth and they, they are making those, 
Uh, they are working with the youth and the family to make those decisions. Okay, and there's not if there's a if somebody's put on that restricted uh, correspondence, they can or cannot they can appeal that. The restricted correspondence is not a, uh, a status for an individual, but it's a, a broader policy that would govern how we do correspondence for all the youth in care. For everyone? Yeah, correct. Not just an individual? Not individual youth. Okay. Uh, certain individual youths may have certain restrictions that are related to them in their, in their individual specific situation. Okay. I understand. Um, okay. That's it for me. Thanks. Do you have another question? Sure. I just wanted to know, did you, do you all ever have a practice of bringing in specially invited guests similar to a career day kind of scenario? Yeah, yes, we do. What does that look like? We, we have a variety. We have constantly have individuals coming in and out. I think uh, recently over the summer we have the NBA Cares Day where we had some um, NBA individuals that were coming out and working with some of the youth. We also have... Um, individuals that are um, in specific careers, like you mentioned, that would come out and speak to the youth about the benefits of those individual careers. So we're, we're constantly looking for uh, individuals that will engage the youth and provide information to them for opportunities that they could be involved with. So I mean, that, that is certainly a constant endeavor. Our, our program is, is very rich in terms of providing services to kids. Have you ever had members of the city council come in and speak to the youth? Yeah, it, as I mentioned before, I think uh, Freedom School also had a variety of individuals from across the city that would come in and speak with youth um, and read to them and participate in the Freedom School activities. Uh, that, that was. That sounds good, but that wasn't specifically what I was asking. Has anybody from this body been invited to speak to the youth specifically? I am being told yes. They, uh, uh, council member, they certainly have. I know um, that the council members who, council member Sam, uh, Amprey Samuel, as well as um, you know some of the senators who oversee Crossroads, have certainly been invited to the Freedom School and those sort of celebrations uh, just last year, and as well as uh, I believe Assembly Member uh, Latrice Walker as well. So, I ask that just to say, invite us. Um, I would be more than welcome and more than honored and delighted to be able to come, and I, and I think I speak for many of my other colleagues that would welcome the opportunity not just to go on tours and that sort of thing, but to actually be able to spend some real time um, with our youth to be able to share our stories and how we got to the positions that we got to and for them to see people that come uh, specifically and directly um, from the same communities that they come from. So I, I would certainly uh, encourage you to see the, the, the city council as a partner um, above and beyond this hearing because at, the, at a certain point you have to come out of the hearings, come out of the tours, and you have to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one dialogue and conversation. So please know that I am more than willing to come um, and more than once um, in order to create a relationship to do that. Uh, we, we would welcome that. Definitely welcome that. In both detention and our close to home facilities, I think it's important. Uh, and one, one quick second, this is semi off topic from your last question, but I do want to clarify the record um, based off of an earlier question by Council Member Rose in regards to Queens. Uh, we had worked with NYPD to actually be able to provide a private space for lawyers to be able to speak with their clients uh, and not merely that the officers just sort of moved away from them. So they do have a private space and based off our last conversation with the Queens Defenders, uh, they are okay on that issue. All right, thank you all very much. Um, our next panel, let, let me also mention, we've been joined by Council Member Danique Miller from Queens. Um, we, our next panel, um, the Legal Aid Society, Citizens, Com Citizens Committee for Children of New York, Brooklyn Defender Services, Children's Defense Fund, Bronx Defenders, and Youth Represent. One nice big closing panel.
Maybe did you get a friend? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if you would all raise your right hand so we can get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Good. Um, have you talked amongst yourselves about who would go first? And Fire away. Just w one second. Can we put... Um, so we're going we're gonna to try to do five minutes each. If you really need to go over, you'll, you'll go over, but we'd like to give us an opportunity to have time for questions. Thank you. Please begin. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Ginsburg. I'm here from the Legal Aid Society, and I am joined by Christine Bella from our Juvenile Rights Division. Um, I'd like to highlight, we've submitted extensive testimony that I'm not going to read, but I'd like to highlight two of the primary areas that we have touched on in our written testimony, the first being arrest to arraignment times. Um, since the 1991 Court of Appeals decision requiring the arrest to arraignment time limited to 24 hours, the city has struggled to reach this mandate. In the last few years, however, compliance has improved. Raise the Age brought a new challenge to this mandate as the state and city committed to a process where as many youth as possible would be arraigned in the designated youth parts, which are staffed by specially trained judges and court personnel. As um, the government testified earlier in the planning phase of Raise the Age, there was a commitment by all city agencies and OCA to ensure that this process went as quickly as possible. In contrast to the rest of New York State, however, New York City still, still, still appears to be adhering to the historical 24-hour arrest to arraignment time, which leaves the majority of adolescents arraigned on Raise the Age criminal court dockets at night rather than in the youth parts, which only operate weekdays. A report released by the New York State Raise the Age Implementation Task Force in August 2019 showed that adolescents were much more likely to be arraigned outside of the youth part, necessitating an additional court appearance the next day in the youth part. 67% of youth were not arraigned in the youth part in New York City as, a pair to, as a compared to only 37% of youth in the rest of the state. A snapshot of our current open cases in the four largest boroughs show that in over 50% of our cases, clients were arrested at a time that would have allowed for an arraignment in the youth part, but were instead arraigned in night court. All teenagers who are arrested during the late afternoon through the morning hours should simply be taken to the youth part the next day for arraignment. Instead, currently, they are being held for the full 24-hour period for no apparent reason, occasionally longer, until the arraignment takes place in night court. The next day, court appearance requires the youth to miss yet another day of school and forces the parent or guardian to miss an additional day of work and or to have to make an additional day of childcare arrangements for other children in the home. The additional court appearance also raises the cost of the process for court personnel and other stakeholders who must again appear at the second next day adjournment. We have not been able to obtain definitive information as to the source of this delay in arraignment, whether it is driven solely by the NYPD or a combination of NYPD and prosecutorial delay. Whatever the source, the delay needs to be identified and remedied, and we encourage the council to inquire into this issue. Um, the other issue I would like to address is the issue of conditions in detention, and that has gone been gone into, um, I think, in some detail earlier in this hearing. Um, I would like to address the, um, the comment made earlier um, that there are teenagers who are getting cuffed for, for, for refusing a direct order. Um, the kids in detention are 16 and 17 years old. That is the age range of the kids in Horizon. They are 16 and 17 years old. And 16 and 17 year olds often do not follow direct orders. 
And in the world, they are not handcuffed for not doing so. They are not handcuffed in school for not following direct orders. They are generally or should not generally be handcuffed on the street for not following direct orders. And kids respond to aggression with aggressive behavior. And then we spend a lot of time in these hearings asking why the kid's behavior is leading to restraints. And I guess what we always want to ask is, how are those restraints leading to aggression? These facilities are particularly Horizon as a much physically much smaller building than RNDC. The officers were used to working in a much larger physical environment. The officers are on top of the kids all the time. They are escorted everywhere they go. They are in physical custody of adults, corrections officers. And so that phenomenon of constantly having adults on top of you, we understand they are in custody, and there's a reason why they are in custody, but the relationship between the officers and the kids and how that relationship is fostered creates the environment in the building. And although there was a period of time where Corrections was really trying to focus on developing relationships between officers and the young people in their custody. I fear that over the last couple of years, we have seen a retrenchment in that, and we are hopeful that there is going to be a new recommitment to that. But this is a very real issue about having steady officers who these kids are used to seeing every day who they have real relationships with, and they can build trust. And if they can build those relationships, then they can build a healthy environment where you, we believe that you will naturally see incidents of aggression become reduced, both on the part of the kids and the adults. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Lanceman, Chair Powers, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Stacy Kennard, and I am a team leader and an attorney at the Bronx Defenders, um, part of the Adolescent Defense Pro Project specifically. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. The Adolescent Defense Pro Project is an interdisciplinary team consisting of criminal defense attorneys, social workers, and an education attorney. Together, we represent adolescent clients age 17 and younger who are charged as adults, um, primarily the young people who are charged as, uh, with, with felonies as adolescent offenders and juvenile offenders. ADP, um, the as the practice is known, attorneys and advocates are specialists in raise the age law and provide continuous representation for the young people charged with felonies as they are charged in criminal and supreme court and then as they are charged in family court. Um, the number of teens charged with felonies in the Bronx has been significantly reduced since the implementation of Raise the Age, but for young people who are still impacted by the criminal legal system, there is obviously significant room for improvement. We've heard a lot about detention, a lot of focus on detention today, um, which is an enormous concern for the Bronx defenders as well. However, I want to talk um, more about what happens to young people before they're detained um, in my testimony. And we've raised a number of concerns. Additionally, in our written testimony, I'll be focusing now on two specific areas. Um, first, the disproportionate rates of detention for young people who are also in foster care. Um, and secondly, stepping back, um, the NYPD treatment of mistreatment of youth who are in their custody between the time of rest and arraignment. Um, so first, with respect to crossover youth, um, as young people are known who have had contact with both the child welfare system and the juvenile justice systems. Um, we have seen in our practice these young people being unfairly subjected to punitive detention at, as a direct or indirect result of being in foster care um, more frequently than we have seen our, uh, our other clients um, subjected to detention. Um, for example, we've seen in family court delinquency proceedings 
um, are children who are ordered detained by judges at the request of corporation counsel, specifically when ACS, which is serving as the young person's guardian, um, has not identified a foster care placement for, for the child. Um, in our experience, young people in foster care are sometimes detained when young people who would, were living at home um, would have been paroled to their parents. Um, in these instances, uh, ACS will often treat detention in the ACS facilities effectively. Um, and by, when I say ACS facilities, I'm referring now to the detention facilities, Crossroads or Horizon or non-secure detention, um, as though those detention centers are a foster care placement. Um, and then they will simply stop looking for long-term and appropriate foster care placements for the young people. Um, likewise, when our clients have been kicked out of a foster home, which is a circumstance obviously beyond their control, they're significantly more likely in criminal or Supreme Court to have bail set, and they're very likely in family court to be remanded to detention in delinquency proceedings. Um, the effect that is that children who have already undergone the significant trauma of family separation and the experience of unstable housing are forced into even more destabilizing and, as we've been discussing, dangerous settings. Um, the issue of punitive confinement of, of crossover youth is not unique to raise the age or to 16 and 17 year olds. Um, children in foster care were prosecuted in family court before passage of raise the age. However, we do believe that this disparate treatment of crossover youth is likely only to worsen now that our clients in family court include 16 and 17 year olds in addition to younger children. And these older youth are more likely to be living independently by choice um, or to be out of foster care placement because of a dearth of appropriate foster care homes or to have been kicked out of their parents' homes due to conflict, um, obviously a somewhat separate issue. Um, these are precisely the scenarios in which young people become more vulnerable to detention and placement in delinquency cases. Now I want to move going back to um, the NYPD. Um, when Raise the Age legislation came, was passed in recognition of the fact that adolescents are developmentally distinct from adults, particularly when it comes to brain development, additional requirements were put in place for police officers in working with young people. Um, to, for example, and the one thing I'm going to focus on is that Raise the Age now requires that youth charged as adolescent offenders or juvenile offenders are detained separately from adults. Um, this is a change that should theoretically improve the treatment of children in police custody. However, the actual treatment of our young clients in NYPD uh, custody has been marked by systemic abuse and harm. Um, and this was noted earlier, but we see our young clients routinely held overnight in juvenile rooms of NYPD precincts while awaiting arraignment. Um, they're almost always to a person, handcuffed to a table or a bench continuously, denied beds to sleep on, um, and provided usually with about one meal in what's often 24 hours uh, prior to arraignment, and have restricted access to water and a bathroom. Uh, this inhumane treatment of children in NYPD custody, well, it may uh, follow the letter of the law, clearly violates the spirit of Raise the Age, it's abusive, um, and we ask that these issues be investigated and that steps be taken to ensure elimination of this practice. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Brenda Zube. I'm a social work supervisor, Brooklyn Defender Services on our adolescent team. I want to thank the committees on the justice system and criminal justice, and in particular, Chair Lanceman and Chair Powers for the opportunity to testify about the implementation and expansion of Raise the Age. Uh, BDS has a specialized adolescent representation team comprised of attorneys, social workers, and youth advocates that are working in our Supreme Court, Family Court, and Criminal Court representing young people. Our team represents nearly 2,000 young people between ages 13 and 21 each year. Um, we echo the concerns are raised by the other defenders regarding pre-arraignment detention um, and the role of DOC in, in use of force and pre-trial detention, um, as well as pro probation and adjustment processes. Um, BDS supports intro 1628, which would amend the administrative code to require ACS and the Department of Probation to report on juvenile justice statistics. 
Reporting is a step towards accountability, but additional oversight remains necessary. Uh, we have concerns that this data could be mishandled or misused and urge that there's clarity on how and for what purpose it will be revealed. We anticipate that the data will confirm what we see every day, that children of color, specifically black and Latino boys, are substantially overrepresented in the juvenile justice system. Future juvenile justice reforms must acknowledge disparities at all stages of the process and actively seek to limit the effects of racial bias and reduce racial disparity. The overrepresentation of adolescents of color in the juvenile justice system causes significant harm to youth, their families, and communities. The long-term collateral consequences of interactions with the system reinforce a vicious cycle of poverty and disenfranchisement. Good afternoon, my name is M. Mena, <clears throat> and I am a policy and budget analyst at the Citizens Committee for the Children of New York. Um, CCC is a 74-year-old independent multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring that every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Thank you to the chairs um, and to all the members of the committees for t holding today's oversight hearing. I would also like to thank the members of the committees for their commitment to improving outcomes for youth in the justice system. CCC welcomes the opportunity to provide testimony backed by our fact-based advocacy and data-driven methods that prioritize first and foremost the safety of children, including justice-involved youth. We look forward to working closely with the committees to create policies that ensure that each New York City youth is afforded the rights and opportunities to learn and grow from their transgressions with minimal trauma and to reintegrate into society with dignity. CCC was a co-lead in the passing of the state legislation to raise the age of criminality for youth in New York in April 2017. These laws were several years in the making and marked a long-awaited victory for New York's children, youth, and families, especially communities of color, whom we know are often over-policed and over-represented in the juvenile justice system. With the passing of Raise the Age legislation, the automatic prosecution and confinement of 16 and 17 year olds as adults ended. This legislation changed how youth are handled in New York's court system and aimed to provide age appropriate services and facilities that would promote an environment focused on the well being for young people. In the last two years, we have monitored its implementation, which removed all 16 year olds and 17 year olds from Rikers Island in October of 2018. Thus far, the data suggests that we are heading in the right direction. Increased reporting on all matters relating to justice-involved youth would further support the progress being made in the juvenile justice system. According to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, which reported on the first nine months of Raise the Age implementation, 80% of 16-year-olds arrested for felonies had their cases removed from the youth part of the state Supreme Court to family court. The city has also seen 61% decline in misdemeanor arrests for 16-year-olds and an overall 30% decline in detention for youth under 18 years old. In this year's mayor's management report, we also found that consistent with the trends um, before the passing of Raise the Age, there was a decrease in the placement of youth in detention facilities as well as a decrease in the length of time of confinement in said facilities. Moreover, there has been a decrease in reported youth on youth assaults. Therefore, today's hearing to discuss the proposed required reporting on juvenile justice statistics by ACS and the Department of Probation is timely. Reporting would offer public data to allow a fuller picture of the juvenile justice system in New York. Transparent, consistent, and ongoing reporting, for example, will help us better understand who is involved in the youth justice system. Key youth demographics pertaining to race, gender, age, and home zip codes, among other data, can provide more information on the types of preventive services and community-based supports their communities need. What types of offenses um, have they been arrested for? And what are the terms of their di disposition, including the length of placement in ju ju juvenile facilities? It is therefore imperative to keep track of what dis misdemeanors and felony youth are being charged with, the duration of their placement, and more generally, the terms of their disposition. In which facilities are youth being placed? What facilities are they being transferred from? For youth who have been 
transferred multiple times, what facilities have they been placed in and why are they being transferred? Keeping track of justice-involved youth is one important way of ensuring that they are provided with the necessary resources to complete their time in the system and to help break the cycle of recidivism. Additionally, the data will include incident reports involving juvenile justice staff and or altercations with youth. Um, if we want to reduce the incidents that occur in juvenile facilities, data and reporting are key to identifying trends and types of trainings and services that can be effective in minimizing disputes. CCC believes that these and other areas outlined in Intro 1628 will further strengthen the juvenile justice system, a system that impacts thousands of young New Yorkers. There are well-documented social, health, and lifelong effects for justice-involved youth, their families, and communities. National research has shown that youth involved in, in the juvenile justice system have high rates of exposure to trauma. A national study found that up to 90% of justice-involved youth report exposure to some type of trauma. 70% meet criteria for mental health disorders, and 30% meet a criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. Girls in the juvenile justice system have even greater rates of exposure to trauma. Um, in a study of youth and detention facilities found that girls and boys were equally likely to have experienced a variety of traumatic experiences, um, except that girls were eight times more likely to report sexual abuse and two and a half times more likely to report severe neglect. These alarming statistics sh should encourage us to continue to pursue and provide a robust network of supports for justice-involved youth, a majority of whom have also experienced trauma. Fortunately, there are now several evidence-based, evidence-informed, and promising practices that have demonstrated effectiveness in addressing trauma, including many that specifically target court-involved youth um, with histories of trauma. A recent study found that justice-involved youth with histories of trauma were less likely to believe they would recidivate when they were provided with mental health services. In light of these facts, CCC views two major areas of concern that are directly linked to providing youth in the juvenile justice system with developmentally <clears throat> appropriate resources to increase their well-being and lead them back to a healthy path. We want, a, uh, we want an update on the phasing out of correctional officers um, and the Department of Correction personnel in youth facilities. And secondly, we, we believe that reporting data accurately and consistently increases oversight and accountability. As we approach the phasing out of correctional officers in youth facilities, this process raises significant concerns for CCC. Generally, the Department of Correction approaches youth in the same way they approach adults in prison Dr. Manor. With, with the use of excessive force. Thanks, Ben. Um, resulting in trauma. As I outlined above, a majority of youth in the ju justice system experience trauma while in custody. Um, youth deserve the, the opportunity to learn from their mistakes with services and positive interactions with well-trained staff who also have the youth's best interests in mind. Um, CCC looks forward to continued partnership with the committees to ensure effective implementation of Raise the Age leg legislation in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Julia Davis from the Children's Defense Fund. Thank you to the chairs um, for getting us together to talk uh, about these issues, to hear from uh, the agencies, and most importantly, to pursue this bill. Uh, we've heard a lot about the successes, the statistics um, about implementation of Raise the Age, and it's really consistent with what we know is going on in New York City and statewide. We are seeing arrests among 16 and 17-year-olds decrease. And that's important because what we're seeing is a shrinking of our system. That's the direction we need to be going in. At the same time, we really need to understand the young people that are in our detention system, that are going through probation, and that are being impacted by Raise the Age. So the bill does a lot of things that we need to do to get under the data, to change the way that we collect and report data, to make it consistent with the new uh, categories of people and places under Raise the Age. So thank you very much for um, pursuing that. I will say that um, what we heard today about the conditions at Horizon really focused on violence, and I think it's an important um, issue that we continue to pursue in conversations here and outside of these chambers. 
It's important to deeply understand the role of DOC going forward, not only at the perimeters, but what we also heard was in rapid response teams, which are the people that respond to incidents that occur in the facilities, where there really is great opportunity and uh, for, for escalation and violence. And so we need to understand um, better what that looks like and why. That is a new component of the reporting bill and is essentially um, a very valuable piece of information we need to be able to see going forward. I will note that while you all referenced the Nunez report, there were a couple of components in there that didn't come out today in terms of disruption for education and programming. What we were hearing was 50 to 75 percent of school days, young people were delayed an hour going to school. This is a facility um, that's really intended to treat young people like the young people they are. The intent of Raise the Age, as we heard before, was to remove them from the conditions on Rikers Island um, where interference with not only their health and well-being, but their access to education and programming uh, was uh, happening all the time. Here, to see that operating in Horizon is very, very troubling. I'll also note that the Nunez report uh, made some conclusions about the efficacy and the effectiveness of facility staff in engaging with young people. I'll quote it, facility staff lack skills in developing effective relationships and working constructively with youth. This is really the primary purpose of putting young people in youth facilities, that we can engage, serve, and meet their needs in a way that's developmentally appropriate. The fact that as of June of this year, uh, we are continuing to see uh, significant gaps in the skills necessary to engage and serve our young people is very troubling, and we're hoping that as things move forward, you um, and your staff members will become involved in that conversation. I will say that in addition to the concerns about DOC's sort of ongoing role at the perimeter as part of the uh, operating the control room, working in response teams, we from the beginning have raised issues about the sort of influence of adult correctional culture in these facilities. So it's so important to us to hear going forward some of the answers you asked for today about what will, what will this place look like a year from now? How will things change? I think it's not only operations, but it's culture. And so it's a much harder thing to measure, but your all spending time in the facilities is a piece of that um, to sense how that transition and change is happening. So thank you again um, for the opportunity today. If you have any questions, of course, we're happy to take them. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kate Rubin. I'm the director of policy at Youth Represent. Thank you to the chairs and the committees and staff for the opportunity to testify. Um, youth Represent provides legal representation to court-involved youth. We assist them with everything from rap sheet review to school suspension hearings, employment discrimination, and any other legal needs they identify. Um, I've provided longer written comments. I'll try not to be redundant, um, and I'll try to be brief. Um, at Youth Represent, our primary goal is to reduce youth involvement in any justice system, adult or juvenile, and to help young people get access to services and resources that they need outside of a court context. And so to that end, the most important metric to us uh, that has come out sort of in the preliminary data is the evaporation effect of Raise the Age that we are seeing here in, in New York. It's been talked about the 61% decline in, in uh, misdemeanor arrests for 16-year-olds, 20% decline for felony arrests. And for me, in, in some ways even more meaningful, the 32% decline in misdemeanor arrests for 17-year-olds before the law even went into effect. Um, so th that's the trend that we want to see. And we hope that as we continue to monitor the data, both from the state and the city, but also through um, the data requested in intro 1628, that we'll continue to see that decline. Um, we do think that intro 1628, the, the data that's included in it, is necessary to fully understand how uh, the Raise the Edge, you know, how Raise the Edge is impacting youth in New York City and to identify changes that are needed. We urge the council to enact it and just to, to highlight a couple things. You know, as I said, we hope that the reporting will continue to document a downward trend in youth detention, but if needed, it can also serve as an early warning system should there be any increase and help us kind of pinpoint where that increase might be coming from and how to address it and turn it around. I want to underscore the importance of the proposed amendment to admin code 21906, which would require more detailed reporting on the use of room confinement, so it would include the reason as well as the length of any room confinement. And I want to highlight uh, proposed uh, 
Section 9206, creating a youth probation report, which is essential because what Raise the Age is doing is sending many, many more young people to family court. We know family court is a service intensive place. We hope that those services are all necessary and uh, directly meeting needs that young people have. We worry that sometimes they're not. Uh, probation also has a huge amount of influence in this area because they control diversion, they control risk assessment, and therefore detention and placement, and they provide services. So uh, it's important to have reporting from them. I think actually uh, 9206 is a good start, and whether it's through legislation or just through ongoing oversight through the committee, I think keeping an eye on probation and young people is gonna be one of the most important roles that the council has to play. Um, ACS raised issues with some of the data points. I would just respectfully ask that the advocates can be part of any conversation about changes. Um, I have some thoughts about there, but we, I, we could talk about those online, um, or offline, rather. Um, and then finally, Horizon. Um, as you all know, I think we testified before this body last year in 2018 in February, in April, in September, along with dozens of other advocates objecting to the city's decision to bring DOC correction officers to Horizon, and I think that has been much talked about. Our concerns were founded. We appreciate all the questions that you all have asked today. Um, I wanna highlight a couple of, the one thing from the report that um, hasn't, I think, been quoted yet, specifically about DOC's, quote, lack of situational awareness and their tendency to either over or underreact to escalating tensions all contribute to the high rate of violence. It was troubling today to hear DOC testify um, that they're sharing best practices with youth development specialists as part of the transition in light of some of the things that have come out in the Nunez report and the statistics and the things that were um, talked about today. And I mean, I would also say it's troubling to me to hear them sort of continually blame young people um, for the incidences in the facilities and, and for the sort of first uh, place that they go and have already gone is they need to bolt the chairs to the floors in classrooms in order to make them safer rather than as many of the advocates have talked about working on building constructive relationships with youth. Um, so, I, and the final thing I will say is that we continue to disagree with the administration's interpretation of the Raise the Age statute that it requires that in specialized juvenile detention, holding those gap year 17 year olds and any kids who were uh, transferred from Rikers last year, that there must be a continued heightened presence of DOC staff. We just disagree with that interpretation of the statute. We think it's not in the best interest of, um, of young people and we think it can be done differently. Um, and that, I think, encompasses what I would say is, is your very crucial ongoing role, sort of continuing to monitor the situation. We, we thank you for it and appreciate, uh, look forward to, to continuing to work together. Thank you. So I just have a, a quick question or comment or for, for pretty much each of you. Um, the Legal Aid Society, I think you would use the word re retrenchment. What did you mean by, by that exactly? Mike. Sorry. When Nunez was first settled, the DOC created an adolescent advisory board that was a very active board of stakeholders that had, um, that met quite often in the beginning. There was a lot of discussion about which organizations should be brought onto the island, how programming should be integrated into the structure of the day. Um, there was a look at various jurisdictions at how they managed kids in different types of facilities. Different states came in to talk to DOC and the stakeholders about best practices. And then we saw over the years less and less uh, focus on that and more and more focus on what you heard today, classification, SRG, gang involvement, and all of those issues essentially taking precedence over how to improve the environment in these it, buildings. Is the advisory board something that was uh, required under Nunez? No. Do you know when the last time it met? Well, it, <laughs> in the last year it has held meetings um, but they have mostly been the agency talking at the stakeholders 
It is my understanding that those meetings are going to start to look differently. There is a new director of programs in the Department of Correction, and I am cautiously optimistic that things are going to start turning around. There is a lot of discussion about using breast practices um, in RNDC. Part, part of what DOC has moved away from is attention in Horizon um, and more focus in RNDC and on the island. But as you can see, if you read the entire Nunez report, things are not going so well there either. So there needs to be, the, the other issue that really has not been discussed is particularly the pre-raise the age kids who turn 18. On their 18th birthday, the gift that we give them as New York City is we transfer them to Rikers Island. This is an extremely stressful period for those young people. There was a period of time where there was discussion about preparing those young people for that transfer and coordinating services from Horizon to RNDC, but we have not seen a sustained effort for those young people. And that transfer is very disruptive, both individually to those young people and to the environment in Horizon. The, the other thing that I would just like to address briefly is this issue of the probe teams. And I know that it's been discussed by other members here, but I, I don't know if any of you have ever been present when a probe team enters, but it is, it is the most unsettling of it. I've been on Rikers more times than I would like to count. It is probably the most unsettling thing that I have ever had to witness. And it is very unsettling for the young people to be in a room and have adults, usually very large adults, suited up in full on riot gear, helmets, armor, the nine yards. Next time you go, maybe you should ask to see what, what, what that actually looks like. So when you talk about DOC withdrawing from the building, except for these probe teams, where they're going to rush into housing areas and common areas and the schools in this gear. And essentially, what they do is they take the kids down. That's what happens. And so when you factor that into the reality that many of these kids are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, that they have long histories of trauma, and that's how we have decided to respond to any disorder is to send in a team in riot gear, then it puts a whole different light on the retention of DOC in, these, in that building. And it's particularly disturbing to us that that is what they have decided to leave in place. We, I mean, we go into the transportation piece, which you can read offline, but the points where they are remaining are points of ongoing conflict and where there's been ongoing issues of, of um, lack of adherence to juvenile justice best practices. This is what they're leaving in place for essentially the next year. And can I just add something briefly to that? That undermines everything else that goes on in the building because young people aren't seeing any distinction between, well, that was done by DOC and this is done by ACS. It undermines everything right. that happens. How, how often at Horizon would a, would a probe team need to go in and do their, their thing? How often does it happen? It's not need. The, the decision is made by DOC when they go in. How often do they do that? I, um, I don't have that data. I mean, right. I'd be making it up, but our, our position is it happens more than it should. It should never happen. Got it. The, the kids in Crossroads are 16 and 17 and eventually will be 18. There is no probe team there. There is no probe team in the upstate OCFS facilities where the kids are sentenced on serious violent crimes. It is not a best practice for detention for children to use probe teams. It's an adult correctional model, which I am not endorsing as to adults either. Got it. Okay. Also, um, 
if the advisory board doesn't resume its earlier <clears throat> role and function, please let us know. Um, for the, the, the Bronx defenders, um, I'm just curious, are you aware of any CCRB complaints or other, any other formal complaints um, about uh, police conduct while, while young people are, are waiting for their to be processed? I am not aware of formal complaints. Um, I will certainly look into that, and um, we'd definitely like to keep talking yeah. about this. I don't know if anyone else on this panel, All right. any other organizations it, have. If you become aware of one, that would be helpful for us to understand and also to help focus the NYPD's attention. Certainly. It does seem to be enacted as a general policy. Right. Got but it. It's, it seems to be universal, at least in the Bronx. And I was, um, it's really shocking for, for the testimony of Brooklyn defenders, although we've heard this from other people, um, that it takes longer for a young person to, to get arraigned and to, 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 to be processed than it does um, for an adult. And you know we're having budget hearings that are coming up in March, and the, the PD and DCAS and all the agencies are gonna be here. Um, you know, if, if it's not to give you homework from today, but you know, if people were to come up with sort of a, a laundry list or a wish list or a, a list of um, uh, physical requirements, physical improvements that would make processing easier, safer, more confidential, um, you know, it's something that we could try to make put into the budget. Uh, obviously, I know it's not just the money and, and capital issues and et cetera, but uh, you know, that'd be very helpful for, for us. Um, and then, um, I guess it's, it's Dr. Dr. Mena. You, you talk about, um, and, and we talked about this yesterday on our, on our tour, how many young people, because we met with the health providers on, on site, the director of mental health services and director of, of medical services. Um, and you talk about just uh, how uh, extraordinarily prevalent is, is trauma in the lives of young people who find themselves in the criminal justice system. Um, are you aware, and what's your assessment of the programming and the services that are, that are provided to young people at Horizon and Crossroads um, to deal with that trauma. When we visited yesterday and you heard them today, they, they ran off a litany of programs and, and services and I'm just wondering if you have had the opportunity to um, think about whether they are providing the right kinds of services for youth who overwhelmingly have experienced some, some degree of trauma. Okay. Any of you uh, need more information? Sorry, I, I don't know. Okay. Well, so put your mic on. Just put your mic on. Your mic. Your mic. <laughs> so I'm, I'm deferring to my colleagues in case they might be able to help okay. answer that question. Does anyone have a, a thought on that? Um, so the, the mental health care provided by Bellevue has been incredible. It's been probably the greatest advance in secure detention that we have seen in my entire many, many years <laughs> doing this work. Um, they are reclassifying uh, our kids with correct diagnoses. They're putting them on correct meds when they come in on incorrect meds. We have many kids who are just starting on medication regimes who had never had access to that and are responding really positively to that. I would say, the one weakness that we've really been working with the agency on, and I think that ACS is committed to doing better on this issue, is that there's not enough coordination between the mental health providers who are on site and the ACS staff who are working with the kids in the housing units, on the floors, in the common areas. Um, and there probably is not enough coordination between the school provider and mental health. And so we do recognize there are only so many hours in a day and there are many things that have to happen in that building. 
but there's a lot of information and there's a lot of um, relationship building that is happening between the kids and the mental health providers. And we think that the mental health providers could do more to help um, moderate the kids' periodic emotional dysregulation, to help train staff on the floor um, in how to um, respond to kids when they go into crisis or they're struggling, and to come up with day-to-day -day plan behavioral planning for the kids. You know, one of my takeaways from, from yesterday's tour, and it wasn't the first time I was at Horizon, including being there a few weeks after the transition when things were going so, so, so poorly, was one, I was, I was very impressed with the doctor from Bellevue and, and the services that they described. Another impression I had, though, and, and I think um, uh, from Children's Defense Fund, you had talked about uh, school attendance, is that for a detention center, it, it seems remarkably unstructured. The, 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 they have school from, uh, what was it, eight, eight, 8.15 or so to 2.40. There seems to be a problem with, with people going to school, which you know, strikes me as very odd. You're in a detention facility. I don't, I don't know how that, that, that works. Not very big. Um, and then after school, they seem to have a lot of uh, unstructured time. And there are things to do if one chooses to avail themselves of, of them. But if not, it seemed like a lot of opportunity to just not, not do nothing. And so it's interesting that your observation, and I, I can't say that I made the same observation because I'm not qualified, I wasn't there long enough. It was a short, you know, we were there for maybe two hours. Um, but it intuitively, the, 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 the medical services, the mental health services providers, which I was impressed with, I, I can see that that's not necessarily translating to what is happening, if not minute by minute, but you know, day to day, on the uh, on the housing units and the other programs that they um, that they have. Um, anyways, so just I, I think you would, the Children's Defense Fund had raised something. I just want to let you know that the stats that we got yesterday on attendance at the school was 60 percent, which seemed, like I said, pretty weak. Um, and then last, just, just the, the youth represent uh, testimony. You know, all of us were very concerned, the council and very, very concerned about the Department of Corrections importing its culture, its practices um, into the facility. I don't know how long it's gonna take to unwind that because they're not even gonna be gone until many months from now. And then even when they're gone, they're still gonna potentially provide um, some services that, that can be very uh, impactful. Um, and, and they did. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. I think, and I, think you, I, I think you did talk about including advocates in discussions about changes and reforms. Um, again, to, to all of you, if you feel like you've got something to say and no one's listening, um, we can usually make them listen. Maybe not do what you want. We can't make them do what we want. But please don't be shy about, about, about that. Can I just quickly yeah. clarify? I just meant um, if AC ACS had raised that they had some concerns about the data reporting requirements and whether they could meet them or that some of them might undermine confidentiality. So just specifically, if there are conversations with the agency about making changes to the bill, we would love to also be part of those conversations. Um, so those negotiations and conversations are primarily with the bill sponsors. Have you? communicated with council members Salamanca and Samuel? Yeah, we can reach out again right, to the good. bill sponsors directly. So yeah. They're, yeah. Two, they're two very diligent council yes. members. Yes. But if somehow you feel like yes. something's not getting listened to, let us, let us know. Thank you. All right, council member Powers. Great, thank you. Thank you all for the testimony, and of course, thank you for the work that you do. Uh, and uh, I had a question uh, related to NYPD. Uh, we've obviously, I was focusing a lot around the corrections aspect of this and, um, and obviously ACS and DOC who were kind enough to give us a tour yesterday uh, of Horizon. But to the point that had been raised around uh, what, what do you do with a 16 or 17 year old or what is being done with a 17, 16 or 17 year old when they're arrested, 
and they can't be put in a cell, I guess, as a, like a holding cell uh, with a adult, which leads to, and we, I think we heard this from somebody yesterday or we had, had come up earlier, um, leads to a 16-year-old being handcuffed and left at a, at a desk in a precinct until they can, um, until they can move them. Well, what is the solution to that problem? What is what what is there is there a recommendation in terms of because I am interested in trying to figure out how to solve that problem. This sounds like an awful experience for a sixteen or a seventeen year old. Um, but what, is there a recommendation or a thought on how we can fix that or what the NYPD should be doing? Obviously, they were not here today. Right, I, we're not NYPD. Um, we understand that NYPD has its own logistical concerns. Um, it has to be fixed. Uh, a child can't be handcuffed to a desk for close to 24 hours um, without anything to eat. Um, but I would leave that, I, that, that is something that should be expeditiously addressed um, by the people in the facilities, by the people in the, in the agency. And okay, any, any others anything have? Anything that the council can do. You could ask NYPD for their data so we can improve the arrest to arraignment times. I suspected you might say that. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, just in terms of programming, um, and I know we have some programmers who are here or were here, can you talk, can anybody uh, just elaborate on some of the, the, the discussion of programming? As Councilman Lansman uh, mentioned, there is a lot, there is programming. We heard about vocational opportunities, I think, that are expanding. There is uh, uh, arts and cultural programming. I know Carnegie Hall was here, I think is here, um, and other opportunities. But also making, the, the important thing is that that matches what the needs are. It's obviously something that is relevant or uh, understood by the individuals. This is a challenge that happens in the, our city jails as well in terms of making sure they're the proper mix. Is, is there any thoughts on the programming that is offered? Um, I, I do understand that, I do recognize that there are challenges to getting people to programming and some of that is the, the right mix and some is other social, emotion, soci, uh, social or emotional issues that are happening that happens to school too. But in terms of the programming that's offered and whether it's meeting the goals and the needs of, the, of, of those young, young New Yorkers or young adults, um, uh, thoughts on other opportunities. So you have the agencies here, so I'm just curious to hear if there's other thoughts on the type of programming that's being provided or ways to improve the offer, the offering of, or, of you know, arts cultural programming or vocational, uh, vocational opportunities. Hi, I'm Julia from the Children's Defense Fund. I'll just say two things. One, in terms of the access to programming, I think it's just important to, to, to specify that the monitor actually found that programming records indicated that the daily schedules were not being followed in the facility and that youth were not consistently getting to the programming they're entitled to. So there's an issue of engagement, what's appealing to young people, whether it fits with them. There's another about operationally making sure kids get there, and I, I just wanted to clarify that. We run a program which is really just a training and curriculum for young, uh, the, the YDSs and the other people that work in the facilities, and that's Freedom Schools. That happens in the summer. Um, that program has been really successful for a couple of reasons, I think. One is because it has an Afrocentric focus that it brings young people and staff out into uh, the yard every day for cheers and chants, for motivational singing, for connection outside of this very... Um, sort of, uh, you know, it's a correctional culture. Um, it's also been, I think, really effective in terms of providing young people the connection to books that really resonate with them in terms of themes and experiences of young people that look like them and have uh, similar experiences. Uh, the third piece of that is, you know, that program really translates into ELL, into uh, DOE credits for young people, and so making that connection between programming and real-world value as young people exit the facility. The only thing that I would add, we are very appreciative of the providers and the facilities, and I think many of the programs are incredible and the kids really enjoy them. Um, one of the things that we lost, though, when the kids moved off of the island into Horizon was there was a, a, a much more robust set of vocational programming um, that was done in conjunction with DOE and also just with, um, by DOC. And as the age, as the kids age up, 
in these facilities and they, we start seeing 18 year olds, maybe 19 year olds in these juvenile detention facilities, we're going to need um, more age appropriate services for those kids and young people really like to do things they can walk away with you know I learn I have a certificate in woodworking I have a certificate in carpentry or you know whatever it is space is an issue in these facilities we understand that they have more of an issue around that than they did on the island because there was more space but we would really love to see some of those that type of programming built out in these facilities thank you that's a helpful helpful feedback um, so I, I just want to thank you as well for your feedback and uh, i share councilman lanceman's uh, sentiment that you know, if there are other issues that come up, whether it's about legislation or uh, operations, please feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'll coordinate with each other about uh, proper follow-up with the agency. So thank you. Thank you. All right, um, that concludes our hearing. Thank you very much for your testimony. Councilmember Powers, thank you for your cooperation. And to both of our staffs, we appreciate all the support uh, you gave to make this hearing uh, happen and maybe even be successful. Thank you very much.